Good morning, everyone. And I think uh, we are like live now. And we are on to the second day of the uh, RADS Mumbai. And today we will be talking about difficult airway. <clears throat> Now everybody uh, you know, knows all the guidelines uh, for published by Difficult Area Society. And you know everybody knows how to manage when you have everything, when you have all the resources. But what, how do you actually manage Difficult Airway in limited resources center? That's what we're going to concentrate on today. And we have five lectures. Is there a jarring actually happening? And I can hear somebody else's. Olive, can you mute yeah, yourself? Thank you. So I think it is. It is uh, quite a task wherein we have, we have limited resources, don't have anything or rather we don't have everything and you have to manage difficult airway, limited resources. Anticipate a difficult airway, yeah, you need to actually decide on what resources you have, how well you will use it. But that also requires that we need to be able to, you know, have regular training on that. And that's also again lacking and that also we will discuss uh, in today's uh, lectures. We will also look at the human factors. Now, one of the issues in patient and people who are working or as freelancers or working in remote areas, they may not have the help which is available in uh, teaching hospitals or big institutes or corporate hospitals. And how do you manage that? How do you actually keep your cool because when you're losing the airway, patient's oxygen is, is dropping. <clears throat> I mean, that's the scariest thing, which, uh, you know, any anesthetist, uh, you know, always dreads. So we will also look at those situations, how to, you know, keep calm. What are the human factors? Uh, why we need to be aware of the guidelines and how we manage that panic situation. So we will be starting off with the first lectures, uh, which looks at the various, you know, equipment and um, look at the uh, available guidelines, the resources which are actually available. And everybody got access to Google and you can search all the guidelines and things. But again, how you replicate that in your setup, that's a different thing. I mean, you may not have a fiber optic scope in uh, the center you work in. So how do you then go and say, that, okay, fine, I've got a difficult airway. I'm going to manage this. Um, so, I think one of the faculty hasn't yet joined, but I have rest of the faculty. I have Pallavi here. Uh, we have Kala, Mega, and Dheeraj, and Uma should also be joining, who will be talking about human factors. Uh, Pallavi will be, like I said, talk, taking the first lecture, which will be followed by uh, Kala, who will be talking about uh, the anticipated difficult area. How do you manage that in a uh, limited resource center? Mega will be talking about the uh, you know unanticipated difficult area in limited resource center. Uh, Dheeraj will be talking about education. How we can ensure that you know everybody gets the training, and that's something very much lacking uh, in India for uh, this limited resources. I don't think we have that kind of thing. In for example, in UK. Uh, in most centers, I mean, despite the fact that I have everything, we have regular difficult airway workshop. Like uh, in our hospital, we tend to have every year um, people 
you know, do go and attend workshops, but also we have airway updates every year. That's a regular feature uh, on our uh, training or the clinical governance. But how do we actually ensure that in, in limited resources uh, set up? How can we make it possible for them? So in a fortnight's time, uh, we have our uh, RADS, which is regional anesthesia, difficult area, segmental spinal a workshop in Mumbai. On 18th of March, we have the live workshop for regional anesthesia. And again, here we are concentrating on and, uh, you know, uh, targeting the limited resource centers, uh, looking at only uh, landmark guided and the uh, PNS guided blocks. So you can't say that just because you do not have ultrasound, you can't give blocks. That's totally ridiculous. You can provide regional anesthesia just with uh, landmark techniques and uh, PNS, and that's what we're going to concentrate on. But on the second day, we have got a uh, live hands-on workshop. We have difficult airway workshop, and we have segmental spinal uh, anesthesia workshop, uh, which are very useful for, for the people who are working with limited resources. So without uh, much ado, I think I will invite uh, Pallavi uh, to uh, start a lecture, our know, first lecture. And uh, Pallavi and all, all the all the faculty, please be free to, uh, you know, introduce yourself. Um, okay, Pallavi, over to you. Have you started seeing my slides? Uh, yes, Pala, we can go on the slides. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So morning, everyone from here. Um, I'm going to start uh, talk about essential equipment we need for anticipated and unanticipated difficult airway. Um, I um, work here in uh, NHS uh, in England. And as Sir said that uh, we do follow the uh, difficult airway society guidelines. And my uh, talk today is mainly based on the difficult airway guidelines and the difficult airway trolley preparation. Also, uh, I will I have looked up uh, 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 on a review article from the Swedish Airway Society, which has amalgamated airway uh, guidelines from uh, the societies all over the world, including the uh, All India Difficult Airway Association. Uh, so. I have in, take, kept in mind about the limited resources of which uh, our freelancers and a few of our practitioners in India face. So it's basically an amalgamation and you need to adapt everything uh, according to your uh, conditions and resources. So uh, I do not have any financial interest in any of the companies uh, which produce the airway devices. So difficult airway um, can be broadly classified as an anatomical difficult airway. Um, most of us uh, as an aesthetist have been trained mainly in dealing with this and we have largely overcome this issue over these years. We, barely, uh, we rarely have um, um, airway complications or CICV situations nowadays because of all the equipment that we have. Physiological difficult airway, um, is a large problem which is underappreciated and um, it will stay on uh, further insights on it. So for both to handle both of these, we need a prepared airway practitioner. Now, the who is a prepared airway practitioner is the one who knows uh, safe airway management. They can display the skills for that, who has knowledge in dealing with that, keeping in mind and having full awareness of the human factors within a culture of safety. Now, this airway practitioner should aim for expertise and not only competence, not just knowing, okay, I know this device, but you should be expert, you should have crossed and you should have flattened your curve, uh, uh, the learning curve uh, for um, every device that you plan to use. 
So as I said, a prepared every practitioner is nobody if he or she do not have the equipment. So the National uh, Audit Project uh, 4, uh, done in UK way back, uh, concentrated and focused mainly on the airway uh, issues that we face, the airway complications, depending on the level of the seniority. Uh, so the it, may, it highlighted also on the equipment and its use. So it showed that even in UK, they had uh, problems getting the equipments. There was uh, no immediate availability. And what you mean by even immediate availability is that every clinical area where you have, uh, where you administer anesthetic, be it be your theaters, be it a uh, critical care area, or be it your non-operating room uh, anesthetics, you need to have an, an ED, uh, you need to have um, a difficult airway cart available immediately. And of course, uh, nothing to replace the skills and experience to use it. Most of the countries do have guidelines um, and they're quite feasible depending on the, the local conditions. But the problem is not just the guidelines, but it's immediate availability. So um, the solution to this is having an airway rescue trolley. Now, what is an airway rescue trolley? So basically it's a comprehensive logical uh, approach depending on the various plans available in our difficult airway algorithm in such a way that we have immediate access. We train our um, anesthetic uh, uh, assistants and our trainees um, in uh, providing us immediate access. So they can give us what when we need what we want. And um, it goes in a very stepwise logical manner rather than having a very haphazard way of keeping things. So how does a difficult airway, an ideal difficult airway trolley look like? So it should have a top work surface and four to five drawers. It should be mobile, it should be robust, stocked in a logical sequence, clearly labeled, can be easily cleaned, and it can have attached documentation in keep, so you can have your the difficult airway society guidelines, or you could have your modified local guidelines, checklist for restocking, and logbook for daily checking, and it should be easily rep reproducible in all areas. So this is how um, the trolleys look like. The one on the extreme left is uh, having uh, the labels which are having the infographics as well. You could have any one of them, but you need to have one. So if the uh, so on the top of the trolley, uh, difficult airway algorithm flowchart is kept. There are other various cognitive aids. Direct access phone, it's always a good idea. So this Swedish article uh, mentions that we need, to, uh, it's good idea to keep a direct access phone numbers to the ENT and anesthesiology or uh, intensive care physician resources. A stopwatch for a person who is scribing who keep, will keep us aware as to the time elapsed since we have started our um, airway rescue in the times of crisis. As we know that our situational awareness and decision-making can get, um, massively affected and Deeraj is, uh, I mean, are we, are we going to talk about it uh, in the human factors? Um, monitors for the video laryngoscope or the video bronchoscope. Alternatively, if uh, it is expensive to have every trolley stacked with these. So in case if you just have one and it is shared in clinical areas, it, clear directions to bring these from where to bring this should be mentioned on the top of the trolley. Side of the trolley uh, should have the bougies, both adult and pediatric, an entry intubation catheter. Now, this is quite a pricey equipment. So to keep them uh, on the side of the trolley can be a bit of a hassle. So again, instructions as to where it is kept should be um, uh, mentioned. An airway exchange catheter and a video bronchoscope. So this is how a trolley should be. Uh, every door should be laid very clear clutter-free, easily accessible. You, know, you, you need to ask what you want and it will be given, handed over to you without having to dig through a, a, a hell load of equipment. Again, an example of a neatly laid trolley. 
So we're going to go through uh, the various uh, plans from plan A to plan D and how and the logic behind it. So plan A is following the evidence. Now, the, the essence of plan A is mainly to get your uh, endotracheal tube in the right place in the very first attempt. So you, you have to maximize your very first attempt because your first attempt is the best attempt. So after you have, um, uh, so your plan A should be basically having good uh, equipment with your basic laryngoscopes, which you are used to, and an alternative blade plus a video laryngoscope and bougie or stylets. Now the other factors will be dealt with in the further lectures. So this is how your plan A trolley should look like, okay? This is a busy slide, sorry for that, but it has all the essential equipment which we need in our uh, plan A drawer. You have your laryngoscope handles, a standard handle and a short or a stubby handle. Uh, laryngoscope blades, the Macintosh three and four, Miller two and three. Now Miller two and three, which is a straight blade is useful for um, dealing with large tongues and patients with uh, I mean, macroglossia in patients with acromegaly, okay? Uh, video laryngoscope blades, you could have your CMAC blades, three and four, your low pros, and also the hyperangulated ones. And if the monitor should be attached to the difficult airway trolley, if not, get one. Endotracheal tubes, sizes five, six, seven, and eight. Extra long endotracheal tubes, the flexible ones, which can be used with the flexible bronchoscope, size four, five, six. Nasal endotracheal tubes, six and seven. Stylet, lubrication gel syringes, five and 10 mils. Magil forceps. So up to the Magil forceps, these are the essential equipment which have also been mentioned in the AIDAA guidelines. Adhesive tapes, wide and narrow, bite block, aspiration cannula for um, drawing up the rocuronium, pre-printed labels. And one must not forget that here the most important cognitive aid is having a continuous wave from capnography to ascertain that we are in the right place. Um, which it, it is an essential equipment which should be there. And I think we should all um, strive to get one for uh, if you don't have. Um, video laryngoscopes have been a game changer. COVID has uh, shown us that they're a very essential part of a kitty. Uh, the 2015 DAS guidelines emphasize that every anesthetist should be trained to use. They should have an immediate access to the video laryngoscopes and they should develop expertise. Techniques for um, normal laryngoscopy cannot be extrapolated onto video laryngoscope. So this is what you're going to learn in your airway workshop um, uh, next week. Uh, very important to get trained and to uh, get uh, ahead of the curve. Um, video laryngoscopes also the, the ease is massive. Like once you start using it, your views better and uh, routine use has to be, it has been emphasized to improve the institutional team and individual preparedness for managing difficult uh, intubation. And uh, as I said, the education is facilitated in real time and through the recorded images, the airway team communication, you can ask your uh, assistant to give pressure in a particular way so as the view is enhanced and then the teamwork can get better. So rather than having as a rescue device, the routine use of uh, the video laryngoscopes has been uh, emphasized. Plan B is all about limiting choices. Now you would wonder what, why limit choice? The essence of again plan B is mainly oxygenation via the supraglottic airway uh, devices. Difficult airway guidelines of 2015 strongly recommend a second generation supraglottic airway device like the eye gels or and um, the ProSeal LMA devices over the first generation uh, supra supraglottic airway devices like the uh, classic LMA, mainly because there is a higher uh, sealing pressure and also you will uh, have better seal, uh, less leak, 
and you could you do have an gastric port for uh, uh, deflation so that's the uh, whole idea of this the article from the swedish uh, guidelines uh, does mention as uh, the classic lmas as a vintage uh, however if you do have access it's a lifesaver uh, but second generation um, supraglottic airway devices is is a preferred one over the first generation the second option is so uh, you could either wake up the patient uh, or keep the supraglottic airway device of, because of the ease of ventilation and you could uh, either go for a fiber optic or a entry so the reason why this uh, drawer is kept very simple is because when you have too much choice your decision making um, becomes complex it it becomes difficult okay because this has been studied outside medicine and when there is an increase in choice there is delay so time is very critical and time is very important it there is inability to decide or take any action at all and uh, so the concept of fast and frugal decision making has been kept in mind and that's why uh, this drawer is very frugal this is how the drawer uh, uh, number 2 looks like so you have the two different types of second generation uh, supraglottic airway devices size 3 4 5 the intubating lmas however um, one of the uh, articles does mention it's not a good idea to have an intubating lma but if you have the expertise in that you could um, have it uh, lubrication gels to lubricate the lma and the orogastric tube for def uh, the stomach uh, deflation adjuvants for the flexible video uh, bronchoscopic guided intubation and endoscopic mask break away uh, oropharyngeal airways so we will connect uh, spray solutions of lidocaine um 10% and also lignocaine in uh 4% solution anti fog solution and a tongue depressor so this is a, a very good uh, infographic from the uh, das where um it shows that what ancillary equipment you need uh, for, uh in case of uh, fiber optic intubations so you have a nasal oxygen catheter for the continuous um, um insufflation of oxygen some uh airway societies have recommended keeping a high flow nasal oxygen uh, device however it's quite a bulky equipment to be kept uh, on the difficult airway trolley you also have the mucosal uh, atomization devices for uh, topicalization of the airway and the oral airways um, as i mentioned Berman, of course, it, it is now discontinued. But you have the Oversapien and the Williams. Uh, you could have the one which we, uh, which is available um, in your institution. So moving on to Plan C, which again emphasizes uh, delivering oxygen to the patient if, if your Plan B has failed. So you, at this point, you have failed your supraglottic airway device, and in that case, you remove it and you. continue to oxygenate the patient with the help of a face mask and again it could be a 2% uh, 2% technique um with the uh, other airway adjuncts like the oropharyngeal and the nasopharyngeal airway now if you succeed uh, the next plan is you wake up the patient so to wake up the patient you will need a reversal uh, of the neuromuscular blockage uh, if you're lucky enough uh, to uh, um, have sugamadex it's a life saver i must say and uh, then if you don't succeed you move on to plan d so this is how a plan a uh, c drawer looks like you have the various size oropharyngeal airways you have the um, regular face mask size 3 and 4 uh, and 5 if you're dealing with bigger patients neonatal mask that's for a uh, ventilation through uh, the tracheostomy uh, port that's uh, the size 0 you have the sugamadex aspiration needle to draw it up and the preprinted labels um as you know in crisis scenario it's very easy to mix up uh, the medications and uh, the various size nasopharyngeal airways so this is how uh, this is what you're going to prepare in your uh, plan um c 
drawer. Now, Plan D is all about standardization. So when you face a CICV um, a situation, a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate scenario, it's important to get airway access uh, through uh, the cricothyrotomy. Uh, the NAP4 guidelines uh, study did show that 50% of the anesthetists could not perform a plan D, uh, I mean, could not perform cricothyrotomy. So why standardization is you need to get used to one particular technique. Uh, I mean, have one particular kit and uh, get used to it or rather get have expertise in that. It's very essential to have a scalpel, a tube and a bougie kept in every area where anesthetic is administered. Okay, so that's how uh, the emergency cricothyrotomy set is. It's by Cook. You could have that and get trained and add the cannula one or just a simple scalpel size 20, a blade size 20, a bougie and a size six or a seven tube should be kept handy in your plan D draw. That's how simple it looks. So again, uh, your plan D drawer. Frova introducers, uh, we uh, can be kept on uh, the side of the trolley. So apart from uh, keeping the ones uh, in the drawer. Now your drawer number five uh, is an extension of plan D. So it should have a, a kink resistant jet ventilation cannula, or you could have uh, your um, high or low, and, and you need to have your high or low pressure ventilation systems like the ManuJet or the Ventrain, whichever is available locally. This is also called as a miscellaneous drawer, but um, where you could keep your combi tubes, your left-handed laryngoscope blades, but I still recommend not to clutter this too much because this is the last uh, step of our um, um, difficult airway guideline. And um, it is important not to clutter any of the drawers for that matter. The miscellaneous things are, uh, as I have, uh, I mean, I'm reiterating again that you need to have your DAS intubation guidelines, preferably laminated or your locally agreed alg uh, algorithm, your equipment checklist, your logbook for daily checking procedures, uh, specific extubation aids like the stage extubation uh, set and the uh, extubation guidelines. So suggestion, uh, these are the suggestions for the draw labels, which can be easily downloaded from the DAS website. They are free to access. And this gives a visual reminder of which stage we are. And it's very good for the algorithm transition. You could train, you, uh, could train your um, anesthetic assistants uh, uh, at uh, very regular intervals um, and explain them how we can go through it. Uh, however, they can be customized according to your local needs. The specific make and the model of the equipment should be lo agreed locally through regular comprehensive and continued tra uh, training provided to all the uh, required staff. And the examples of the equipment mentioned here are just guidelines and they're not absolute recommendations. So according to your local um, guidelines, you can uh, tailor them. Now, every anesthetist should uh, work on strategies rather than plans. So what do you mean by a strategy? It's a coordinated logical sequence of plan for achieving good uh, gas exchange and prevention of aspiration. We need to have a generic plan before every list or a case, or, or you could have a specific strategy for every di anticipated difficult airway cases. Uh, this reinforces the knowledge, preparation, and uh, improves the teamwork as well. Remember always, less is more. A clearly labeled trolley serves as a visual guide and helps moving from one uh, strategy to another, if not making progress. Avoid cognitive overload. I would always emphasize on this because it's a very important uh, part in uh, while we consider the human factors when your situational awareness reduces and you have too much on the platter to serve for you. So that can actually create uh, havoc. 
What is most important is providing the right equipment in the right amount, in the right place and at the right time. COVID was here to teach us a lesson as well. So what we have learned is institutional preparedness is the key in managing any crisis. Universal use of laryngoscopes, uh, video laryngoscope and the second generation superglottic airway devices have been recommended by all the guidelines. Now, if you see, read this Swedish article I've mentioned, the, the reference at the end of the uh, talk, this did not very strongly recommend video laryngoscopes, but because this article was published early to 2019, COVID wasn't there. And then every society has changed to um, emphasis on the video laryngoscopes. Uh, limiting the choices and use of reliable techniques in which um, every uh, faculty or every person should be trained uh, ensures a safe, accurate and the swift airway management. So to summarize, you, you need to plan, you need to communicate, you need to prepare yourself and of course train in uh, every aspect. So these are my references and thank you very much everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pallavi. Um, I think that was comp very comprehensive and uh, including all the guidelines, um, especially I think DAS guidelines are, uh, they are a lot more simpler, uh, very precise. Uh, now the uh, plan D, uh, I think you mentioned and I showed the, uh, you know, cricothyroidomy, um, sets and things but i i thought they have actually the newer guidelines have moved uh, straight to scalpel bougie and tube <clears throat> scalpel size 10 that is what standardization is so every every trolley should have a size 10 scalpel a ventilating bougie and a size 6 tube it is size 6 tube for every every case because you you know i think that's what the adult guidelines actually say but then again, like I said, it is uh, all uh, up to the local, you know, what you feel comfortable with. Sorry, uh, sir. I said, ultimately, it is about uh, what people feel comfortable with. And I what they're trained. I can't hear you, sir, very clearly. Uh, can others hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Ah. There must be yeah. some issue with your... Probably, yeah. I shall mute. Yeah. So I think um, standardization is is very very important. Keeping it simple, that's what it is. That the other system is the uh, your vortex system again, the Australian vortex system that is also simplified, and which probably is similar to the uh, your DAS guidelines. It's just that it's a different way of saying that you are actually going into a whirlpool, you're going down and down, spiraling down. And that's, I think it's more of a visual than saying plan A, B, C, D, but I think it follows the same, absolutely the same, same thing. Uh, <clears throat> most people would have watched, uh, you know, a video, uh, you know, Bromley's, uh, where they actually talk about where they, people get fixated, or oh, I have to get the tube. Getting the tube is not the a goal. Keeping oxygenation is the goal. And preventing trauma. I think one of the things which people tend to ignore is that the more attempts you have, the more trauma you cause, the more difficult airway you make it. So you need to have uh, that in mind that you should not try to cause because more aggressive you become with trying to get a tube in and the more trauma you cause to the airway. So the aim in a Unanticipated difficult airway should always be that you cause the don't cause too much trauma and maintain oxygenation. That should be the goal uh, at all times, and that need to be remembered all the time. It is about life. Uh, you don't okay. It's not about your ego of getting the tube in. You don't get a tube in. Doesn't matter. But at least you know keep the patient alive. Uh, anybody else has got any comments to make or anything, Doctor Kale here? Yeah, I think uh, Pallavi has rightly uh, emphasized on the availability of difficult airway equipments and uh, the availability as well as their readiness to use. 
whenever the situation arises. That's a great job Pallavi has done, no doubt about it. Um, I'd like to quote one incidence in my own life here. Uh, as Pallavi has rightly uh, emphasized, the expertise is very important and you need to practice again and again to train yourself to use that whatever available equipments you have. That is very important. Now, in the last two, three months back only, my own brother was admitted in uh, one of the uh, very tertiary care hospital in Pune, where he was admitted in ICU. He was a case of rheumatoid uh, arthritis and maybe lung fibrosis. He was, he was to be put on ventilator. He was in ICU. At the at around nine, in the night, 10 o'clock, he needed to be intubated. I was myself over there. The expert uh, anesthetists and intensivists were called. They had everything you had mentioned in your uh, lecture just now. Uh, all the equipments were available. Right from fiber optic scope to video laryngoscopes, buji, frova, everything everything but just because there was a uh, neck extension was not possible they could not intubate him in front of me and they had to go for tracheostomy in front of me now what they didn't have was only expertise even if i was there i was ready to help them they didn't allow me because i was not the part of their department that is different thing that's this thing. But what I want to emphasize is you're training yourself, getting acclimatized to your equipments daily and practicing every day is very important. So you have to train yourself to use the equipments at the right time and right place. So that is very important. And Pallavi has definitely uh, did a justice to all these things. Thank you very much, Pallavi. Yes, sir. Um, I think irrespective of your level of seniority, we must always think that we are students. That's what we are here Absolutely. for. Absolutely. And uh, attending, if we do not have access to, um, you know, the wet labs, it's you could get yourself trained in the anatomy uh, labs uh, for, you know, your um, front of neck access airway access so you could you could find a solution to it if your uh, institution can't provide or you do not have access to wet labs absolutely yes anybody else who would like to uh, comment or add anything to what pallavi has just presented uh, Preeti, yeah yeah, exactly. Uh, I would agree with Dr. Pramod, uh, sir, here, because uh, you may have everything, you may have the best of equipment, but if you do not know what to use when, uh, that is where we are doing harm to the patient. So generally, what I try to advocate is have a very short tolerance for inability to be able to deliver what you wish to. If you cannot do, uh, you know, you cannot intubate the uh, patient at the first level, Forget it. First thing, call for help. Start oxygenating. Meanwhile, go to plan to B. When you cannot uh, pass an STD, again, the second call for help should go at the same time. Progress to plan C. There's no point trying to use the same laryngoscope, the same tube, trying to force it into the patient's trachea. There will be a lot of uh, you know teeth falling off and there's a lot of trauma around. There's a lot of bleeding that is happening and you are destroying, not just distorting, but destroying the airway. So there is no harm or no shame in calling for help. And uh, yeah, that's that's mainly what I wanted to say. Pallavi said that very well. Thanks, Pallavi. Uh, thank you, Preeti. And I would uh, recommend uh, all the faculty and uh, even the people listening today's talk, if you can go and uh, check out this video by... Uh, uh, of course, it will be dealt much in detail when, the, when we talk about human factors. But this video where... Uh, I will not take names, but it's a it's a pilot's wife who has uh, was um, she had the similar scenario, and uh, in the end, um, rather than suing the uh, trust, he made it a point, and he has become a very uh, great uh, person in training people with the human factors. So this is uh, where the situational awareness and the human factors come into play.
So uh, any any questions? Um, I don't see any any questions uh, been uh, been asked by the uh, delegates. Now, just a comment on the importance of positioning, head positioning, uh, during a difficult airway management. Yeah. And that is it. Yes. The, I think uh, get yourself comfortable and then deal with the airway. Always make sure you are comfortable and the patient is being ventilated. Yeah. I mean, we obviously don't, we didn't, I think Pala, we didn't go into details of <clears throat> the plan A as much. She has only talked about the equipment part of it. But uh, one of the most important thing is uh, your assessment of the airway. <clears throat> and uh, when you fail the first time, <clears throat> maintain the oxygenation, and then you start actually looking at have you positioned the patient properly? Have you used the right size blade? Okay. And if you not use it, or would you want to go to the uh, video laryngoscope so that everybody can actually see what's happening? Okay. So those things are, are there. The number of attempts are equally important. Like I said, when we talk about number of attempts, why have they been limited? That's the reason is that you do not cause more trauma. Okay, you limit the number of attempts, but each attempt is not with the same blade. It is not with the same laryngoscope. It's not with the thing. You need to actually, you know, make sure. If you think you're perfect, then, you know, say that I've done everything is accordingly. I've used the right size blade. I've used video, video laryngoscope. My position is perfect. Okay, maybe give and then I say, no, I'm going to move on to the next step, which is just going back to the basics. So fixation is, is one thing which you need to get away from that. Yeah, I have to get the tube in. Fixation should be for oxygenation, that I am maintaining the oxygenation throughout and I'm not causing trauma to the airway. Thank you. I think since there isn't uh, much, uh, you know, questions, and I think uh, the faculty is also uh, given their input, we can actually move on to the next uh, lecture. And uh, Kala, you can actually share share your screen. Yes. So Kala is going to talk to us about uh, anticipated difficult airway in a limited resource center. How are you going to manage it? Okay. Welcome everyone to RADS 3 in 1 conference. On behalf of the organizing committee, I thank every faculty and delegate for your support and dear Shiv sir for this opportunity. I speak on anticipated difficult airway in limited resource setups. What are the situations uh, in small nursing home or limited resource setups wherein we face anticipated difficult airway and we have to tackle them skillfully and safely? Certain elective surgeries uh, like hernia, thyroid, tonsils, head and face neck cancer surgeries, post uh, radiotherapy patient comes for some other surgeries, obese patients. In emergency situations like fractures, uh, fracture uh, face, lefort 4 with head injury and other trauma, the cesarean sections, the obstructed airway tumors and abscesses which need definitive airway immediately. The surgeons and hospital owners of uh, low resource setups are really smart and astute. They are good in doing the evaluations, check the airway and look for uh, comorbidities and match it with the uh, compatibility of their setup, their staff, the backup, the physicians, the intensivists, the anesthesia and the anesthetist skills. In short, they optimize the patient and the environment and only then do they accept the patient. I forward few cases which uh, all of you have been can relate to and must have managed well in your practice. This is a case of Burns neck contracture uh, release. The burns occurred at a very young age and now the patient is 20 year old and she's come for contracture release. There is no extension, but the mouth opening was around three centimeters. This is a patient, 55-year-old diabetic with Quincy or dental abscess. It's very painful. You can see broken tooth 
and the mouth opening of around two centimeters with the neck extension being quite moderate. This patient was listed for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the mouth opening of around 1.5 centimeters, no availability of fiber optic bronchoscope, no ETCO2 monitoring, and no video laryngoscope here. This patient had come for trismus release surgeries with a mouth opening of less than one centimeter, and the fiber optic bronchoscope was not available. This is a post commando with PMMC flap uh, surgery, the patient had come uh, for elective inguinal hernia repair. This is an oral cancer patient for a PMMC flap. And this is a fungating neck tumor lady with huge mediastinal and neck nodes. She was posted for definitive airway. She had obvious strider. This was an emergency. This is a morbid obese patient who had come almost more than 150 kgs and uh, she was for fractured neck femur. These are oral abscess cases which uh, they come on routine cases. This is a discharging sinus of the neck, an elderly lady uh, who had a, a free flap surgery done for cancer tongue. There is history of radiation. This cancer tongue surgery was done six months back. Now she was posted for exploration of floor of mouth and neck and possible rotational flap. Now in all these cases, the, and these are anticipated difficult airway and the gold standard is awake fiber optic intubation. But is fiber optic available in limited resource setups? Yes, what are the challenges we face in limited resource setups are unavailability of airway devices, unavailability of a good functioning workstation, anesthesia machine, unavailability of trained personnel. The anesthetist may or may not be trained well in uh, a difficult anticipated or unanticipated airway. Also the expert help, whether if they are calling the second anesthetist, whether they are available on that particular day, the time, or if uh, the, uh, this is a remote location, so you may not get an expert help easily. Even the hospital staff and the OT uh, uh, personnel are not trained and all are not on the same page to help each other. Unavailability of monitors like ETCO2, unavailability of post-operative care monitoring and ventilator also is a decisive factor. And there is no standard protocols available. Now, these are the four most important P's that is predict, plan, prepare, and perform. How do you predict a difficult airway? The main predictions is for difficult intubation, difficult oxygenation that includes difficult bag mask ventilation and difficult supraglottic airway devices, and then predictions of difficult cricothyroidotomy. We come to the Murphy and Wall's prediction for difficult intubation. Mnemonics is lemon. L stands for look externally, that is facial, neck trauma, radiotherapy done, a beard, a mustache, large tonsils, uh, short neck evaluation, that is a 3-3 rule, with the mouth opening of six centimeters or less, whether you can include three fingers at the mouth opening into incisor gap the thyromental distance of six centimeters or three fingers and the thyrohyoid uh, distance of two fingers or four centimeters. The Malampati score, everybody knows, if it is four, it is associated with always more than 10% difficult airway. Obstruction scores, sleep apnea, whether there is history of snoring, if there is some obstruction by some tumor, the large epiglottis, recent neck surgery, and Last N stands for neck mobility, that is a short neck, whether it is mobile, uh, whether the patient has some neck collar uh, or the previous uh, cervical spine surgery, radiotherapy done, and if a patient is elderly. Now the ASA originally defined difficult intubation as requiring more than three attempts or, or taking longer than 10 minutes to complete intubation. There are many uh, RCOA analysis, meta-analysis of more than 35 studies, which says that two centimeters is required to insert an LMA. 
an inter incisor gap of five centimeters or three fingers is needed for intubation. Four centimeters for an insertion of LMA is a simple test with a relatively high predictor value. Coming to the prediction of difficult bag and mask ventilation, the mnemonic goes as MONS. M stands for mask uh, seal difficulty, which uh, may be due to facial features like beard, moustache, saliva, or blood, the anatomical uh, disruptions uh, such as uh, facial fractures or retrognathium. O stands for obesity of BMI of more than 25 or a parturient at term. Age of more than 55 years is also a uh, uh, predictor for high risk. No teeth or an edentulous patient snoring or stiff lungs, that is obstructive sleep apnea, history, a bronchospasm, a neck radiation changes. Coming to uh, the mnemonic for difficult LME insertion, that is the RODS, that is R stands for reduced mouth opening, O stands for obstruction, and D stands for distorted airway. Okay, uh, S stands for stiff neck or lungs. Now, difficult mask ventilation is termed as the inability of an unassisted anesthetist to maintain saturation above 90% using an FiO2 of 100% and an IPPV where patient saturation was above 90% prior to intervention or inability of the said anesthetist to prevent or reverse signs of inadequate ventilation during positive pressure ventilation. And a difficult laryngeal mask ventilation has been defined as the ability within three insertion attempts to place the laryngeal mask in a satisfactory position to allow clinically adequate ventilation and airway patency Clinically adequate ventilation means a, no greater than uh, 7 ml of uh, tidal volume, 7 ml per kg, with a leak pressure no greater than 15 to 20 centimeters of water. Here again, the at least 2 to 2.5 centimeter is required for an LMA insertion. The mnemonic for difficult cricothyroidotomy is SHOTS. The S stands for surgery or any other airway obstruction around on the neck. H is hematoma, which can also include abscesses or infection. O stands for obesity. R stands for radiation, distortion, and any other deformities. And T stands for tumor. When you have all the three trinity of airway, challenging uh, uh, the trinities of the difficult airway, then you have to consider an awake technique. Therefore, you have to plan accordingly. And how will you plan? When you, uh, first of all, you decide whether a patient will cooperate with an awake laryngoscopy. Awake intubation, you can use either a conventional laryngoscope or a video laryngoscope. In the case of the contracture release patients, you can either use a TIVA, a small amount of ketamine or dexketamine and release the contractures and then have a neck extension and intubate because she had good uh, mouth opening. Or you can insert an SGD, then release the contractures and give neck extension, remove the SGD and then intubate. You can uh, use a conventional laryngoscope, pass in a bougie, railroad an endotracheal tube, awake and then induce the patient. Now, you, for all this, before planning and preparing, you have to consider the type of surgery, whether it is elective or emergency and can be done under RA, like that patient of commando, which was had come for uh, hernia, you can easily do uh, it under regional anesthesia a block or a central neuraxial blockade with everything, as Pallavi said, ready for the difficult airway a complex intraoperative and postoperative complexities also has to be considered, okay, when you're planning for uh, intubation. And the anesthesia skill and limitations, the anesthetist uh, limitations should be considered and, and a, a skilled help in terms of expert anesthetist and exp uh, trained, experienced, skilled staff should also be available. The patient cooperation is utmost importance in uh, awake intubation. 
also the location resources, that is availability of MRI, CT scan centers, especially for trauma patients associated with head injuries and facial fractures, whether you have an ICU care, a blood bank in the vicinity, and where is your nearest advanced care center location, all that has to be considered. NAP4 results uh, found that most common cause of airway mishaps in anticipated difficult airway was failure to plan for failure. That means your plan A, B, C, D was not in place and failure to execute the exit strategy, how you can come out in an anticipate the difficult airway. And hence, you prepare accordingly. Being prepared for intubation equals to being prepared for any sort of emergency. Make a plan, build a kit of equipments you are comfortable with and be informed of the merits and demerits uh, and the limitations of the equipment and yourself too. Tracheal, and then you perform the tracheal intubation knowing all the above, either awake or asleep. And asleep is if uh, the patient should be arousable and be able to maintain the airway while you are pre-oxygenating and para-oxygenation and uh, the, uh, throughout the uh, tracheal intubation maneuvers. You, what, what all you will you use? A fiber optic intubation, if available, a conventional laryngoscope can be used, a video laryngoscope can be used, blind nasal retrograde intubation, or tracheostomy or a cricothyroidotomy. Now coming to airway anesthesia for awake uh, intubations, good anti is given preemptively because saliva can deter the vision in uh, airway intubation. Uh, airway blocks include the superior laryngeal nerve blocks, which uh, blocks above the, uh, the larynx above the vocal cords. This eliminates the glottic closure reflexes. The glossopharyngeal nerve uh, blocks the oropharynx. It prevents the gag reflex and transtracheal installation of uh, uh, it blocks the larynx and the trachea below the cords and eliminates the cough reflex. Now, for the nares, you can use topicalization and packing of the uh, nose with uh, LA-soaked gauze pieces. Nebulization is also a very effective mode of uh, airway anesthesia. Nebulization with lidocaine 4% via a face mask for 15 to 30 minutes gives highly effective anesthesia of the oral cavity and trachea. It's extremely simple and comfortable for both the patient and the anesthetist. The anesthetist need not know uh, about the various blocks and spray as you go is uh, like LA spray directly into the desired mucosa. Ready-made 10% sprays are available or you can uh, use the 2% or the 4% lignocaine attached to a 10 ml syringe and uh, using the McKenzie technique, uh, create aerosol using your own uh, oxygen from the cylinder. Remember that you have to con uh, take uh, keep in mind the toxic doses of LA when you are going for airway anesthesia. Now, this was a difficult airway for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. I very well knew this patient had a cervical spine fusion surgery. Neck extension was limited, but I got carried away because the mouth opening was good and the pre-look uh, 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 using the video laryngoscope showed me I could see the uh, pogo, pogo score was around 30 to 40. I thought it will improve with relaxation and I will get much leverage. But it, for my surprise, I couldn't get more. And uh, uh, the I was using the channeled blade of uh, King Vision. I had to, which was very bulky and it does not allow any manipulations intraoral. So I had to shift over to a non-channel blade and uh, I guided the bougie. I could see the slit, little slit of the vocal cords and I had to use a magils for pushing the uh, bougie inside and then later on railroaded. Uh, so, so an anticipated uh, difficult in, uh, intubation, uh, even though plan can go wrong. For neck abscesses, you uh, do awake intubation. There was no video laryngoscope available. ETCO2 was available. Uncooperative uh, patients due to uh, pain. And uh, some I could do with uh, just uh, high flow nasal oxygen and uh, using TIVA, minimal amount of ketamine and regional blocks of the superficial cervical plexus. But, uh, but this particular patient had a lot 
extending into the uh, retropharyngeal areas. I gave a mandibular block. There was good pain relief. It improved the mouth opening. It allowed laryngoscopy. But then again, he had limited neck extension. I could not. So keeping him awake, he was pain free. I introduced a bougie nasally with the ETCO2 attached at the proximal end and guiding me. It was like a blind nasal intubation using Bougie. And later on, I railroaded the ET endotracheal tube and induced uh, the patient. This was a patient for a restricted mouth opening uh, for lap cholecystectomy. He was, uh, the airway was nebulized with 4% xylocaine and blind nasal intubation was done guided by the breath sounds. Now coming to blind nasal intubation, passing a tube into the trachea, mostly through the nose without any helping aids to visualize the larynx, that is laryngoscope, is called blind nasal intubation. It is, this is mostly when the fiber optic is not available and fiber optic cannot be performed in soiled airway or upper airway with narrowed pathology. The position uh, this can be very helpful and life-saving. Position is supine, sniffing the air position with the neck extend, uh, neck flexed and head extended. Nares has to be well lubricated and numbed using the xylocaine jelly. After checking the patency and uh, to accommodate the endotracheal tube, advance gently uh, using external laryngeal manipulations and guided by the breath sounds and, and or a capnography attached to the proximal end. Now, if blind nasal intubation fails and bronchos, fiber optic bronchoscope is not available, retrograde intubation comes to your aid. For that, you have to know your laryngeal hand handshake very well, know your neck anatomy, uh, performed with the non-dominant hand and with the performer on the left side of the patient. The index and the thumb finger grasp the top of the larynx, that is the greater cornu of the hyoid bone, and the fingers and the thumb then roll down the thyroid laminae to locate the cricothyroid cartil uh, cricoid cartilage, and then the middle uh, finger and the thumb rest on the cricoid cartilage, and, th uh, and the index finger is palpating your cricothyroid membrane. This is a site for entry. Okay, now retrograde intubation has two parts that the first is uh, the guidance of the catheter uh, from the uh, retrograde from the larynx to the mouth or the nose and then the blind part that is insertion of endotracheal, uh, endotracheal tube into the trachea without visualization of the vocal cords. Now, after doing the laryngeal handshake and localizing the cricothyroid membrane, insert a 16 or 18 gauge epidural needle, identify its placement in the trachea by the LOR method and aspiration of the air, guide the catheter with the slight angulation of the cephalad angulation of the needle. The catheter comes out orally. Okay, and or if not, the, ask the patient to spit out the catheter, which comes uh, on the posterior pharynx. The distal end of the catheter is then clamped with a artery forceps. Feed the endotracheal tube on the catheter, holding the uh, catheter taut, and railroad the endotracheal tube over the catheter inside into the glottic glottis. Okay. Now, if the uh, nasal intubation is required, pass a soft rubber tube nasally and bring the uh, uh, nasal tube from the mouth, guide the uh, catheter into it, or you can tie the catheter along the uh, lateral eye of that uh, rubber tube and then bring it out nasally and then endotric, uh, railroad the endotric uh, tracheal tube over the uh, a taut guide wire. Okay. Alternatively, in, if uh, you do not have an epidural set, you can use an IJV guide wire or a urologic wires, whichever is available. Now, the, for the discharging sinus patient management, we had continued the uh, oxygenation and a check laryngoscopy was done. 
uh, where you couldn't see beyond the base of the tongue and we could not lift the jaw because the patient had radiotherapy, uh, undergone radiotherapy. So a weak video laryngoscope, the Cormac Lehan score was around two and Pogo score of 70%. The ventilating buji was introduced via the left nares, but it could not pass into the glottis. Orally, you couldn't see the buji, so I couldn't guide. So I asked the assistant to use a tongue depressor, a depressor to push the tongue beneath the video laryngoscope blade, and then I could see the blue buji. Uh, and the Magill's, uh, Magill's forceps was used to push the bougie into the glottis under the guidance of video laryngoscope. And then a seven number armored tube, a flexometallic tube was railroaded over it. Here I had used a combination of techniques. This comes to the hybrid technique and its uses in limited resource setters, settings. This helps in reducing the time for intubation the trauma caused due to repeated attempts and the difficulty is reduced and it prevents failure. You can include a combination of techniques that uh, with a direct or a video laryngoscope combined with either uh, optical stillet, a video stillet, a fiber optic, an airway exchange catheter, an iron tree, a retrograde placed wire or an SGD placement. Even an SGD placement can be combined with either of the above. Many random um, randomized controls trials uh, using hybrid technique have been reported that greater uh, success with the first attempt intub at intubation. Now, this was a video laryngoscope with the bougie through an SGD. So you can see the bougie and with the video laryngoscope, they manipulated the bougie into the uh, uh, glottic opening. And all the while, uh, the, uh, you know, this was, the bougie was introduced through the drain tube and the patient could be oxygenated using uh, the umbu bag attached and the oxygen was attached to the umbu bag. And here they are showing that SGD placement and a guide, a guide wire can be introduced uh, as in the retrograde intubation and brought out through SGD and over which the endotracheal tube can be railroaded. Now he who fails to plan is always filing, planning to fail. So as uh, Dr. Pallavi said, prepare your own difficult airway, trolley, cart, bag. You make your uh, bag as a private freelancer. You can have this bag. It is worth every penny of yours. Uh, and the last resort that is plan B, you come to the scalpel, uh, cricothyroidotomy. It's very simple to remember. 10 number scalpel, bougie, and a 6 number endotracheal tube for the front of neck axis after the laryngeal handshake and the cricothyroid membrane is identified. Make a first a longitudinal midline incision over the cricoid uh, membrane and identify the membrane with blood dissection, blunt dissection and make a 90 degree turn to include a short transverse stab incision in the lower part of the cricoid membrane, stabilize the larynx, okay, introduce the bougie and then railroad the endotracheal tube over the bougie into the trachea. To summarize, predict, prepare and plan. Have a pre-formulated strategy, as Dr. Pallavi said, for the management of anticipated difficult airway. This strategy will depend upon the condition of the patient, the comorbidities, the cardiopulmonary reserves, consider the aspiration risk, age, cooperation and consent of the patient and the relatives included, and skills and preferences of the anesthesiologist. Assess and evaluate thoroughly. When appropriate, perform awake intubation if suspected a difficult airway and one or more of the conditions of the following apply, that is difficult ventilation with back mask and uh, supraglottic airway disease, increased risk of aspiration. If the patient is incapable of tolerating even brief episodes of apnea and there is expected difficulty and emergency in the invasive airway rescue. Always remember to pre-oxygenate and increase the safe apnea period. Uh, and uh, also try the no DSAT technique and the uh, ethnic insufflation by paroxygenation should be done throughout. An uncooperative or a pediatric patient okay, reduces your 
option either awake or anesthetize use airway maneuvers to facilitate the uh, intubation determine the benefits whether a non invasive versus an invasive approach to the airway management if an emergency surgery you may have to go ahead or else you can if it is an elective bring out the patient and keep the patient safely oxygenated go through the previous records history and always help in uh, strategizing your plan no single test is a, a, a good predictor a combination of test and parameter Tests are required, and even then, nothing can hundred percent prevent uh, predict your uh, uh, difficult airway. Still, you can unco encounter unanticipated difficulties, which will be taken care by Dr. Mega in the next uh, lecture. And while performing, keep in mind the passage of time. You have to understand that the number of attempts taken and the oxygen saturation you have to get tuned to the monitor uh, beeping uh, uh, noises and analyze where you are, where which direction you are going, and whether you can or should go in that direction and formulate your plan B, C, D accordingly. The alternative approach. Should be ready. Meanwhile, all the time, remember to pre-oxygenate and para-oxygenate the patient. Seek for help, as Dr. Preeti said. Have a low uh, trigger point to ask for help, and no shame in asking for help. As soon as you understand it is a difficult intubation. Here we are talking about anticipated. So in your PAC itself, you should start asking for help and seek expert uh, help. Okay, especially in low resource setups. in fact uh, you can think of double setups like uh, keep an expert surgical help who can perform tracheostomy quickly at the drop of the hat and they are ready with all their equipments gloved in the ot with you when you are doing your airway maneuvers and do not hesitate to refer to higher centers there is no shame in emergency stabilize the patient keep the oxygenation and call your friends in the higher uh, centers to help the patient and finally extubation intubation is an emergency and extubation is elective extubation is an art extubate only and only when the patient is safe, fully awake and safely oxygenated never hurry uh, to extubate Thank you so much. Thank you, Kalap, for an excellent uh, presentation, and uh, I think uh, uh, you covered every aspect of uh, you know managing a anticipated difficult intubation in a uh, limited resource center. I think uh, beautifully covered uh, every aspect of it, and I'm sure the delegates uh, who are uh going to be part of the uh, live workshop will greatly benefit from the uh, hands on experience they're going to have on that day where we will have so unlike uh, we have in the uh, develop centers uh, where they only look at you know uh, using everything we will be actually uh, having stations uh, uh, for uh, retrograde intubation uh, blind nasal intubation uh, which is not very well taught in uh, the uh, developing countries or developed countries but uh, that will be covered um anything uh, any other faculty would like to add or suggest and uh, i think uh, everybody has i think there was a message uh, uh, kala just uh, did a uh, you know difficult airway workshop uh, for uh, you know where people can you know be present uh in the in the theaters with her and have a actual experience of what actually goes on in the theaters so actually uh, we give full hands on yeah. and uh, right from ba back mask holding and you'll be surprised so, so many uh, do not give a good position so yeah. the attached mask but the airway is not open with a simple uh, na position and you are yeah. not actually uh, oxygenating the oxygen is attached but it's not going because your airways are not open so yeah. right from position the back mask uh, how to hold the back mask a tight seal and how to uh, evidence based confirmation by etco2 and your pressure volume loops you can understand whether what you're holding is uh, yeah. adequate or not so that way they can learn 
everything right from the basics to advanced uh, in uh, fiber optic or advanced uh, uh, SGDs through which you can intubate, etc. Video laryngoscopes, everything. Yep. So that's uh, one of the issues I think is is uh, training. I think uh, what my observation has been is that uh, we tend to have this uh, uh, what we call the curse of knowledge. Uh, just because we know how to manage things, we think that uh, the others can do it as well. And same thing happens even at a junior level. If you don't teach them properly, you don't teach them the physics involved in uh, airway. You know, what is your oral axis, your pharyngeal axis, your tracheal axis? You do not understand that concept, how you bring them in one line. You are not going to be able to actually do a good intubation or laryngoscopy. And that, that is not, I, I can tell you with certainty, if I actually took, say, 100 students, uh, maybe 5 to 10 may be able to tell me that properly. The rest of them will not be able to actually they are, you know, uh, describe what exactly it is. So those, those things are equally important. And I actually pay a lot of attention to that when I'm actually teaching is how you position the head, what is extension, what is flexion, how you bring into into a single axis. And why you're not able to visualize the thing. I think use of video laryngoscopes is fantastic, I think. But I think standard uh, training with direct laryngoscopy is very, very important. I mean, there is a lot of, I'm um, on Twitter and there's a lot of thing goes on. Oh, everybody should be using video laryngoscope. Yes. But in developing countries where the cost is a very important factor, are we going to use a single use uh, video laryngoscopes and throw them in the bin. That's what we do in, in UK. I mean, we use it and it just goes into the bin. So you got plastic, you got batteries, you got bulk, you got so much of actually waste in there. And people on site talking about zero carbon <laughs> and then saying, so there's a lot of actually, I think, conflicts actually going on in there. But in uh, the uh, you know limited resource center, you have to have your own you know, guidelines says, I have, these are my resources. This is my plan A, my plan B, plan C, plan D. This is what I am going to do and stick to that at every time. And you should be able to have all the resources for yourself. I think don't rely on anybody else. And Dr. Kale, you had something to say here. Yeah. So actually the residents are coming out are trained with the video laryngoscope and they do not know the conventional. Yeah. Uh, one. So they have to learn the conventions and the previously passed out, they are good at the routine laryngoscope and they are learning the video laryngoscope. So yeah, video laryngoscope is not difficult to learn if you know what uh, your conventional laryngoscope is, but it is the other way around. If your yeah. video laryngoscope fail and you are given a conventional laryngoscope and then you are not able to see, say, I'm used to only seeing on a on a video, I can't, I don't know how the actual <laughs> larynx looks like, then yeah. it's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. So, the, But the it, basics of position, sir, is yeah. uh, highly lacking in the sense uh, uh, with that uh, two curve, three column theory and uh, how, uh, you know, the static and the dynamic, how the static phase helps uh, in your laryngoscopy is, you know, uh, hmm. very much lacking. So I will... You, that skills need to be developed. In my experience, nowadays I have I'm seeing new students who want to learn fiber optic laryngoscopy or fiber optic scopy, video laryngoscopy, and very various other advanced equipments to use. But to teach a new student how to hold the mask and do bag mask ventilation. It takes a lot of time for them to learn that. I think that basic things should be taught to them and they should become expert in these basic things to hold the mask and do bag mask ventilation, give proper position to the patient and then how you can ventilate the patient without uh, any other equipment with simple bag and mask you can ventilate the patient. But that technique, I think it takes a lot of time for them to learn. And then they should go for further uh, higher equipments and all those things. 
Yeah, it's interesting because on our time when we didn't have the uh, supraglottic devices, we used to do short cases by holding the mask. And uh, at times, uh, absolutely. I remember. I remember the first day I actually went to the uh, uh, theater in uh, in the. I started my uh, post graduation in PGI, and immediately the final year students were there. Some of them are actually on my on our group, yeah. And they they said, "Oh, here is shift ventilator." <laughs> <laughs> so they. There you go. He said they sat. They finally used to actually just sit in the thing. Your juniors are actually ventilating. So learning to ventilate, okay, to hold a mask. Yeah, to that, those are our basic, which is actually declining. In, with the in our early days, in maybe 80s, we were taught to hold the mask yeah. with gas, oxygen, and ether for at least half an hour. Then only you will be able to, uh, you will be given intubation and all those things. The fingers so used we were to train like that. Yes, the fingers used to pain afterwards. They're not pain. threatening up. Yeah, and yeah. these situations, I like to again uh, quote one situation which I had faced in one of the camps, because mm -hmm. these difficult airway situations you many times face in the uh, face in a camp-like situation. Generally, through uh, rotary, we do uh, musculoskeletal deformity correct corrective surgery camps within various places of Maharashtra and UP and all those things. In one of the camps I had gone in UP in some remote place called Chandausi, there the camp was arranged in one of the eye hospitals. And actually, I didn't know anything what the equipments are available for anesthesia over there and all those things. When I landed up there, I was told, yes, we are we are having, a, and they, they showed me only two xylocaine bulbs because that was an eye hospital and they had only two xylocaine bulbs for anesthesia, nothing else. And I was supposed to do all polio corrective surgeries in children, maybe five years of age to 18, 18 19 years of age. So maybe the surgeries were very small, maybe tendon transfers or supracondylar osteotomies or something like that. And then we had planned to do it under maybe total intravenous anesthesia. And in those days, that was maybe somewhere in uh, 90s. So in those days, we used to use a lot of ketamine for these kind of surgeries. And I thought, okay, we can do with this thing. So I could gather with some freelancer anesthetist over there, I could gather one ambu bag, one laryngoscope, and maybe two or three uh, endotracheal tubes of maybe 4.5 and 5 sizes. That's it. And then we started the camp. We did al almost 100 or more than 100 surgeries in that camp. On the last day of the camp in the morning when I was, uh, I had induced one patient and uh, then that patient was maybe around 15 year old. Uh, after giving him some ketamine and this thing, he started uh, gasping and his airway got choked up. He was sinosed. And then I was looking for, okay, I had an ambu bag. I could ventilate with him ambu bag. And I just looked back that freelancer anesthetist had taken his ambu bag uh, <laughs> previous day night. So mm -hmm. I actually had nothing to do, what to do. Then I, I could somehow manage with proper uh, triple manure. And then I had to actually give mouth to mouth breathing to that patient and I could save that patient. But this kind of situations, okay, yes, we didn't check. That was our mistake, okay, what is available and we should go ahead with these camps or not. But this is a learning uh, situation. You should properly uh, see what infrastructure available to you and then only decide what you are going to go or what you are going to do ahead. So this kind of situation arises in the camps. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod. Um, before I actually ask, Priti has got her hands up. Uh, one thing which is not part of the difficult airway, but is always there at the back of every machine we have here, is that they have to have an ambu bag. Every anesthesia machine need to have an ambu bag because when everything fails, there have been situations even in UK where in, in Liverpool as well, where the electricity failed completely. Wow. And one hospital, even the generator failed to kick in, and that's now become a thing. So it's checks and rechecks. We always learn from our mistakes. Because here, you know, electricity going off and thing is not 
ever a thing. But in their hospital, they even despite the fact they had a generator, but they had not been checked, they just thought that, yes, it will kick in, but it didn't kick in. So, and, and the workstations are becoming more and more sophisticated. They're all computerized. They are all electrically driven. And when everything fails, your Ambu bag is a thing. So always make sure that you have an Ambu bag. When you go to any uh, of your theaters or nursing homes or uh, corporate, or whatever is the first thing, check that they, you have a, a functioning Ambu bag. And also in, uh, this is uh, when I was a resident at Ames in Delhi. Uh, one patient actually died. It was a relative of a doctor, uh, his wife, uh, because the Ambu bag was dismantled and they, they oh, didn't know. They didn't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, so this kind of situation happens. So check, recheck. Every morning, look at what your kits. And sometimes you use something and that need to be replaced. So you need to have that. And in, if you look at the checklist, which are done by our, uh, we have operation department practitioners, they actually carry a book. Every day they actually put a take, okay, this is checked, this is checked, this is checked. Just like what you have, if you look at the airline, they have a checklist and they go, okay, fine, this check, this check, this check. So have a simple kind of check. You can have it on your mobile. You can have it as a PDF. You can have a to-do list. But have that every day in the morning. Do make sure that this is checked, that everything is available to you. Every life matters. And I think uh, none of us feel, you know, <laughs> you know, we do all feel really bad when things don't go our way or we lose a case. Your whole day, whole month, whole week is actually, you know, it, it is depressing. Yeah. Sorry, Preeti. Out to you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah. A few points here uh, regarding the Ambu. Just like Dr. Pramod sir said, I had a situation wherein um, I had finished my case and I was leaving. This was a very small nursing home, probably a five or six bedded place. Uh, the next anesthetist had come in for the next case because I had to go elsewhere. And uh, there was some problem with the airway. So they started using the Ambu to uh, sort of uh, resuscitate the patient. And at the same time, we had a patient who was brought into the labor room straight away gasping she was in status uh, asthmaticus and we needed to oxidate her as well so here we were in a very small hospital very small low resource setup with one ambu bag and two patients requiring it so all all that i could do was you know you make the staff hold the oxygen for oxygen mask for the uh, the bronchial asthma patient i had to rush to the other side put in a tube over there, get that ambu here and try and resuscitate this patient. So even though you have all the equipment, sometimes things are just not going your way. So you can always end up in trouble. Another beautiful point that Dheeraj has pointed out is about the Dunning-Kruger effect, where one, uh, you know, somebody who has a limited uh, amount of knowledge or maybe even adequate according to themselves often tends to overestimate their um, uh, what should I say, efficiency or uh, this, you know, and ends up being complacent as uh, uh, when you face these difficult situations. So uh, I think we should all always be uh, eager to learn something new. It's like, you know, every morning when you set out of home, you always make a promise to yourself, I shall learn and do something new today. Or even if I don't do something, I shall learn something. Now in the place where I work in one of the hospitals, it's a common um practice between us to just walk into the other theater and see what the other person is doing. Like if I'm in between two cases, I will walk over to the next theater and see what the other person is doing. So it's very commonly uh, during inductions is the time when we walk in. So if there's some help that is required, you are always there, you know, uh, another qualified working hand is always around. So with these interactions, you know, somebody has come up to me and said, okay, you're doing a block. I would like to learn this particular block. So rather than doing what I had in mind, probably we could try another block, something new. And uh, there was this guy who kept on telling me that I've tried a VLS, I've tried it many times and it somehow doesn't work for me. And then please do it and show me. So this is just a very recent thing about a couple of months back. And I was like, yeah, why not? We'll do it for the next patient. And uh, we went at it together. He was like, no, you hold it and you show me. Simple thing, like, because we are used to holding a conventional laryngoscope, people of my uh, generation. So when a VLS comes into your hand, again, that grip needs to be taught. The grip needs to be learned. It is not like holding a conventional laryngoscope. The placement of that laryngoscope with a conventional laryngoscope, we tend to go a lot inside and practically try and, you know, reach the base of the epiglottis. Whereas with the uh, VLS, you are always away from the glottis, away from the uh, epiglottis.
So how to hold the laryngoscope, the kind of grip that you require on a VLS, the kind of angulation that is required, and then the tube guides in. So here it was like, you know, you are going to do it. You are going to push it in. I'm only going to give you verbal support from behind. And the tube went in beautifully. And the next thing I know is like, you know, a few days later, he says, I've been successfully intubating all my patients. So it's always, you know, go in with an open mind. And uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of problems can simply be solved by asking for help. You know, just open your mouth, ask for help, and it shall always be yours. Uh, thank you, Prithi, for your uh, comment. And uh, I think it helps. Uh, I think like, for example, Kala's uh, presentation had a lot of those examples of cases that people face day in, day out, and how uh, she has managed. I think uh, these kind of... Uh, experience-based learning is very, very important. And that's what the group does. I think uh, uh, if you go back on our group, on the GAS uh, Facebook group, uh, there is a huge discussion about uh, video learning scopes. I've posted quite a lot of things. And uh, with late Piyush Malik, I think we have discussed how, you know, you need to use it successfully. Uh, and same thing as you pointed out. No, you don't have to push all the way. Uh, how the view where the larynx need to be seen on your on your screen that is very important okay and again it's it's a it's an image it's not at like direct laryngoscopy where you you see the tube going how you manipulate the tube or you use a bougie now during during the uh, covid time one of the things which was uh, done to improve the first pass uh, for us in our hospital that we say irrespective of what your view is just pass a bougie and railroad the tube over. That was our standard protocol. Even though we have free access to video learning scope, we said maybe we may not actually have them. And then in the end, when we really need them, we won't have them. So our was use a conventional uh, laryngoscopy, direct laryngoscopy, and use the bougie for every single case. That was our, our uh, protocol in our hospital. So bougies are very, very useful. And I'm again surprised that some people, as they say, oh, we have never seen a bougie or I haven't used a bougie ever. So we assume that because we have got access to that, everybody has got access to it. And that's but, uh, not... I had bought uh, around 12 UGs in conferences. Uh, I mean, we got we get for, uh, you know, across the stalls without GST and taxes. And I gave it away to each nursing home as a Diwali gift. Mm -hmm. So, you know, during the VAD day, we get this... So, so I think everybody can, you know, bougies generally, if you keep in the car or if you carry it around, it loses a shape and it breaks due to, uh, you know, something kept on it. Or so. so it has to be kept straight and straight. it should be available wherever you go. So yeah. I think if I am not the anesthetist tomorrow there, but the bougie is there, it will be helpful to anyone who's coming. Yeah. And, and that reminds me, the bougie, which Dr. Vivek Gupta has actually designed, that is a because it's not made of plastic. Now, if you look at most of the things are made of plastic, uh, especially the uh, ventilating bougies, you cannot actually fold them, but his bougie, you can. And it's longer as well. It's much yeah. longer than uh, the normal normal bougie. So and I it think has a soft tip. Sir. It's so has it got a soft tip. It is a traumatic tip. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's a very important. Tip. Yeah, that is, that is true. Though you may not actually feel the clicks when you're using a thing, you may not feel the clicks as you clicks, go yeah. because that is the corded tip. Uh, is it corded tip? It is corded tip, sir, yeah, but it is, uh, but, you feel the it clicks, just, yeah, it jumps yeah. over, but you do not get the uh, like, resistance. It's yeah. different. But you will feel it. You will feel it. Yes, I think yes. the time you will actually get that feel of, uh, you know, yeah. they're passing over the trickle rings and uh, getting those giveaways. Yeah. It will feel I find Froa also is very useful in uh, this, these situations when you have a buji or something like that. Froa is also very useful uh, equipment you should have uh, uh, everywhere, actually. But it's costlier, so, sir. So yeah, I agree. Costlier. It is costlier. But uh, so, still, uh, so it helps a lot. So yeah. what I have, I have done or I have insisted at uh, low resource uh, nursing homes or settings where I visit on some days, I've insisted that at least buy and keep or I've gifted them a Froa each because it is difficult to carry a Froa with you at each and every place. Mm -hmm. Though you may carry your, uh, as Kala rightly mentioned, you should make a bag of your own with uh, all appropriate and adequate sort of equipments and gadgets which you would need in case of a difficult intubation. So I carry my own video laryngoscopes and uh, SGDs and others, but then 
I find it difficult to carry that long flower everywhere. So <laughs> what I have done, like uh, what Kala has said, either I have made them purchase or I have gifted them, and uh, it has stood me in good uh, uh, stead all throughout. I was just imagining, I mean, the all the uh, freelancers, you know, like uh, old time, like Ram having the circus, <laughs> you know, he says, there are the bougies in the, in the back. Sir, uh, in, in, my, in my car, uh, there is a slot behind the passenger seat. Na? There is yeah. some, uh, so two, three of my bougies sit there straight. So when the yeah. car goes for washing and all, I have to remind them, please remove my Puji. I It will get lost. No? It fits in exactly in that slot yeah. very well. Yeah. Yeah. You have to remember another thing in India is that the temperature outside is actually yes. pretty high in, in summertime. And that can affect <coughs> the Puji. That's why the life of the Puji may not be as good as what is there in the uh, uh, control temperatures. So I think, but a Proa is just a, it's a trade name of the company. It is basically yeah. a ventilating, ventilating bougie and you need yes. to have the adapter. It's got a, uh, the adapter, a rapid fit uh, connectors, uh, which can be connected uh, to a, uh, you know, uh, jet ventilation, which is not advised now because they have seen a lot of trauma from that. Jet ventilation is no longer advised as part of that, but you can have connector, which is can fit to a, a normal uh, ventilation or even to an ambu bag. And with high high flow oxygenation, you can actually ventilate. And you have to remember again, other thing is that uh, increased CO2, rise in CO2 is not a problem. It is that getting the oxygenation, which is actually most important. Hypoxia should not be, hypercarbia is not an issue. Um, and that, that can be taken care of once the airway is secured. <clears throat> Anything else? I think there were a few uh, comments. I think like, for example, I think everybody, uh, uh, Deepa and Dr. Chitra, they all have said that yes, basics are very, very important. And uh, I think that should be taught for the year one. Uh, when the, you know, the PGs are starting off the day one, I think there should be more emphasis on uh, the, how the head is positioned, what is neck, what is sniffing there, how you, align all the axes together. Those things are very, very important. As somebody has... I think, sir, can I? Yeah. Yes, please I do. It was an excellent talk by, by Madam. And I think the 4P, if I have to just like maybe do two points uh, summary for this thing, we hmm. talk about the 4Ps and we just, the newer generation, especially they just concentrate on the last part that is perform. And they okay. simply forget the predict, prepare and plan thing. And if somebody uh, does the predict, prepare, and plan thing, the performance is always going to be easy. So if I have to give a one-liner message, follow the first three Ps very sincerely to have a very easy fourth P very lastly. I think that that is what I think uh, should everybody very should good. be for. Yeah. What a wonderful. I think that you can uh, have that in your slide <laughs> for teaching <laughs> <and> training. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it'll be very, very important. Um, Okay, I think that's another comment about the Buji uh, design by Dr. Vivek Gupta. The people have been using it and uh, find it uh, really use, useful for both oral as well as nasal intubation. I think people have been using it uh, nicely. And they say that it, it can be autoclaved and uh, because it's foldable, it's more durable. And like I said, Dr. Sujitra again uh, said that I think uh, holding a face mask and learning those skills okay, are important. And the way I tend to do uh, that is uh, exactly uh, give, I don't use saxamithonium at all. I don't know when I last used saxamithonium, I don't remember. All patients, my favorite uh, neuromuscular blockade is cisatricurium. Uh, so give cisatricurium, I'd say, okay, continue ventilating now. Let's see. <laughs> so three minutes, I say, keep looking, keep ventilating. And you can actually see them. Can I do it now? No, 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 go no. continue ventilating. <laughs> So I think that is the, that actually gives them because with saxamithonium, you know, less than 60 seconds, you're ready to intubate. But with uh, your uh, uh, cisatricurium, you have to give three minutes at least uh, yeah, for them. So that gives them a chance to learn to how to. And then on, you can on, teach, uh, on mask that. ventilation, on mask ventilation, I remember those days in maybe. Mm, now 85, 85 to 90, when we didn't have fiber optic scopes, 
we used to have uh, rigid bronchoscopes for maybe foreign body removal in the bronchus and all those things That's and right. those were also not ventilating bronchoscopes no so only pediatric ones were pediatric yes. ones were ventilated yes. but the other one down on so yeah. there was actually a fight between the bronchoscopist and the anesthetist for the airway yeah and yeah. in in those days when when the bronchoscope is we used to take a child for removal of for foreign body bronchus under gas oxygen and halothen mask detect it deep under with only precordial stethoscope as a mm-hmm. monitor right. yes and then take patient deep and leave it to the uh, bronchoscopist when he used to go inside catch the foreign body or something he has hold the foreign body and while that time there there was no pulse oximeter there, there was no uh, mo- oxygen saturation monitoring nothing so you have just precordial stethoscope and when there starts bradycardia then you have to ask him remove 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 and then you have to actually push the surgeon yeah. out and then ventilate the patient again with bag and mask all those things were the, so that was very important to learn the bag mask ventilation at, at that time and then again ventilate again take deep patient and then again hand it over that kind of situation we have faced and that is how we are trained so i think that those basics uh, even for new generation are also very important you cannot forget them now i think uh, like you said uh, this is this is basic course of knowledge we are facing uh, because we have been trained in that and we assume that the, the juniors will be getting the same training and right. that's where we need to actually stress that uh, the juniors have to be taught you have to come back he says when we were there this is what we did uh, and this is this is part of development yes. you know we have very early learning scope we have fiber optic scopes we didn't have that and uh, like you said pulse oximeter we had only one pulse oximeter when i started it was intensive care so when we were doing foreign body we used to actually take that uh, pulse oximeter to the theater so those things we actually have lived but that time it wasn't there people think that uh, you know what is available now was available all the time the juniors think that we have been trained in everything and that's why our training would be and we think that the juniors already know what we knew so that is where your uh, curse of knowledge lies and uh, i think uh, training 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 i think that's the issue and again even for those people who like us think that we are experts we still need to actually go and train ourselves and nothing better than uh, as seniors uh, teach and you when you learn as you teach so we are also picking up the knowledge as well once we are teaching even so, in today's okay. situation even in today's situation when we are extubating a patient or something like that and patient starts desaturating i have many times observed most of my juniors or my students they will just look behind at the monitor and they will just start oxygen saturation now it is 90 80 70 all those things but they will not concentrate on the breathing of the patient what is happening over there i always tell them ki you concentrate on the patient if patient starts breathing if you are able to ventilate the patient the monitor or saturation that figure is automatically going to come there is no point in watching that yeah. so you And have to watch the lag. yes there is always a small lag between the what monitor shows and what is happening in the body so that's not always thing so you need to just be able to just hear that should Correct. be in your background you need to be actually looking at the background and concentrating more on the patient patient yes uh, i think uh, we've had a quite a good discussion on this part and i think we should yes. move to uh, the next uh, next session of the unanticipated which is actually a lot more important probably in a sense that okay fine you are prepared you have all your four p's but well, what if all after all the four p's you are still in difficulty that's what mega is going to take us through so mega yes. over Hello. Yes, sir. Hi, Mega. How are you? I'm good, sir. Thank you. Nice yes. seeing you. Let's start the screen share. Okay. So I hope the screen is seen, sir. Uh, yes, Mega. Okay. And you're very so, clear. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. after this huge discussion now the burden i can feel the burden but uh, let me take a deep breath okay we'll go through this so today i'll be talking about unanticipated difficult airway in a limited resource setup 
so the fancy institutes are all backed up with uh, things. So we let us see how we go about it. Uh, something about, okay, wait, why is this not? Just use your cursor. Uh... Yes, yes, this is not working. Let me go through this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm uh, Dr. Megha Gupta. I, I was a freelancer in Mumbai for about eight years. Then I shifted to UAE. And uh, here I have worked in both uh, bigger setup and small uh, limited resource setup in here as well as in India. So bear with me and uh, guide me through this. Okay. So the aims and objectives of this talk is first and foremost is to identify oneself to be in a limited resource setup. Uh, if you are not aware, then you will not be prepared. So, and then after that, uh, overcoming the limitations and how the same can be achieved something about your own difficult airway card and something about a brief thing about training as to who, how and when and who should train. Okay, so what is a definition of limited resource setup? Uh, this is something I, you know, came to my mind. You could be limited in manpower, you could be limited in material or your knowledge could be limited. So that is very important that you identify yourself to be limited in either of these categories or all of these categories and then how to go about it. Uh, in the Association of Anesthetists 2014 study, it's a Danish study, and they said the reported proportion of unanticipated difficult intubation was ranging from 75 to 93%. And that is uh, where it underlines the uh, importance of being prepared at all time. And... Uh, that is one of the reasons you should train yourself because more often than not, you will face this situation of difficult intubation. So what is limited in manpower? Uh, like as the name is very self uh, suggestive, the number of people that are going to be around you in a particular situation are going to be less. So say for instance, uh, in the freelancing practice, you go to a setup, it is you. There is no, no nobody called the ODP or anesthesia technician to assist you. There's this one surgeon, one scrub, and one uh, ward help, the unqualified one, the uh, mama or maushi whom we call them. Uh, that, that's about it. And maybe one person, one nurse who comes and just dumps the patient in the theater and goes off. So the number of people helping you is four. And you know it from the beginning. At least that is a known factor. Second thing, it is irreformable. That is, you cannot increase the number of people even if you want to, or you pay from your pocket. So this is the thing. So call for help should be a very low threshold. As soon as you feel something that it is not going in the correct way, be prepared to call for help. As everybody has uh, stated, there is no shame, there is no ego. Call for help. Hmm? Because you already know you are in a limited manpower setting. And in these settings, what happens is, uh, please induce the case. Uh, doctor will see one OP and then he will come inside the OP. So even that surgeon who, who is supposedly more knowledgeable about their way may not be available in the theater at that given time. So uh, in case where you find that there is difficulty, ask the staff, go call sir now inside and because we cannot intubate this patient, I need help or call for some other anesthetist. So that is where your limited manpower comes into picture. Other limited uh, resources set up could be other nursing homes with two theaters, maybe. So if, uh, as uh, Preeti suggested, that it is a good practice, you, know, you to just take around, be friendly with everyone, because you can call for help from the uh, neighboring OT. So just be aware of your surroundings and uh, people and call for help early. Now, what is limited in material? All the necessary equipments may not be available in that particular facility. But we will talk about it as to how to make that difficult airway kit as uh, told by Pallavi, uh, that how the kit is and how difficult airway kit and of, of the department you can make if it's a, a smaller institution. Maybe everybody doesn't have fiber optic, but besides the fiber optic, other things can be easily made available. So try to make those kits. Here, what I would like to uh, suggest is, uh, uh, and I'll show it in the images, even the smaller nursing homes, which you frequent, make it a habit to check what material is. Uh, then another emphasis I will be placing on is uh, the checklist. Like in our learning days, uh, we had very good seniors who were the third posters when we were the first posters. Dr. Kare will uh, vouch for that. 
our standard question was okay you are in the ot what all will you check for so it was like a standard checklist which is still date we follow checking your own cylinders your suction your electricity supply your ambu your laryngoscope your tubes or the equipments so uh, not in that order but power supply suction and the ambu bag were very very important part of the checklist so this is a checklist mental checklist central supply whether it is connected to the central uh, oxygen supplies all all this is a part of checklist so in a way if you make it a habit in the material part of it you can sail through most difficult situations and the very important thing lack in knowledge so uh, if you are uh, too confident or you are not take, uh, able to accept that okay i lack in knowledge or what people have said here is exaggerated idea of personal ability one of the studies says so people have ill conceived perception that they know everything and nothing can go wrong so that is a, a hindrance to self growth and that is where uh, one should be aware about uh, one's capabilities whether he or she can handle it and as i said again not everybody is same there should be no shame in uh, identifying okay this this is where i stop and this is where further i cannot go okay then self education that is where the workshops and these uh, repeated guidelines most of us will be repeating the same thing over and over again plan a plan b plan c this is to put it in the brain it has to have a image in the brain that okay what is plan a what is plan b and what is plan c and last but not least the plan d then a soft skill developments and applications uh, as in a limited resource setup not uh, everybody has the same uh, capability to help you so you should know that who can do what and make it, maintaining your cool in that uh, the pulse oximeter makes that desaturation noise and keeping your cool so that requires soft skills so make it a habit to use people include them even in your regular cases that is why so not do not use this as your rescue techniques but use as your routine techniques uh, include including everybody and taking them along as you go even for a routine case baba xyz can you come here this is called nasal prongs can you put it on the patient yeah thank you so much it's not that you cannot do but this is how you will train them so in emergency th these are the people who are going to help you so rescue uh, routine use rather than a rescue use of even personal is uh, uh, suggested okay so now let us go to the difficult airway aids that is the material part of it hmm? and uh, these are the guidelines on which we are going to talk uh, these are easily available on the net and what i suggest is uh, in our hospital which is now a limited resource hospital we have put all these copies and we usually laminate them and they are at the back of each crash card as well as uh, the back of uh, our each uh, workstations because uh, no, we are human beings and we may tend to forget so if somebody is thought block at least uh, one of them can start reading it okay doctor we can we do this can we do that so that is how it's going to help you so lamination and putting up of this uh, in each and every nursing home it doesn't cost much but it will save you the trouble in the uh, unanticipated or anticipated difficult times now this is a simple uh, uh, airway equipment mcoy blade or trupti blade in india and uh, it is a mandatory thing not very expensive so each of us must have it in our own or if your nursing homes are okay with it buy and keep it in each one this helps to lift the epiglottis and in a difficult airway it could be a life saver so worth the investment not much of an investment another thing is buji which is uh, called by different names by different companies but this is a buji which is again going to be a life saver so no harm in buying for self and even uh, howsoever the resources are limited the hospital or even you can buy like dr kala said she has gifted as diwali gift because at the end of the day it is going to save some life uh, if you do not want to gift that's still okay but for yourself and in your kit it is a must it has to be there uh, if you are a single person or a freelancer this is a must and as uh, again do not use it as a rescue use it as a routine also sometimes so that in emergency people will know how to assist you because you are the only person putting the buji the assistant has to put some jelly put it through hold the tape so that is that cannot be taught suddenly on one fine day when it is unanticipated so make it a habit to use it regularly then i am not advertising any particular one but this is a simple handheld laryngoscope this is the king vision one 
not very expensive again it can be a part of your uh, difficult airway kit or uh, trolley easy to carry and as again try using it in normal patients so that it will be a life saver for you in your emergency situations again cost is not uh, not much even if you are a beginner in your freelancer uh, do try and invest in or if you are uh, whenever you are going or visiting a new place see if they have one and try to use it it is a good practice okay now coming to plan a you happen to uh, a visit and you happen to have a difficult airway situation so this is as per the difficult airway society as a guidelines you would uh, ask to give somebody a burp so what is burp backward upward uh, pressure to the right so uh, what what burp is uh, people will not understand who are in the room what burp is so what i have done when i was there was like come here give your hand hold it here and push it like this this is what you have to do there is no shame but this is how you can uh, do it and uh, this is part of the algorithm or if the required pressure is too much ask them to remove it change the person or change the device or any use of stilet or bougies so uh, this is a pictorial depiction of your plan a and uh, it can uh, remain in your uh, mind you know other thing is this is one of the way you could use a bougie called the kiwi technique so you fold it and preload the tube over it so that the tip of it goes anteriorly and you can put it in the larynx uh, through the vocal cords and then railroad it uh, as again i will uh, more emphasize again and again to use it in routine practice so that it can be done in emergency no new thing do not try new things in emergency never ever do what you are comfortable with okay so you are uh, in giving example of this uh, plan so what happened is um, i was planning uh, this is a real life uh, scenario unanticipated difficult airway surgery a surgeon of my regular practice this was some 17 18 years ago i was not much comfortable or uh, doing cases on supraglottic devices though i had igel with my kit and this lady we i started induction i tried to uh, ventilate and we used to use succamethonium very regularly i do a scopy and boom, nothing cormac lihane four and uh, what to do now but uh, after that the jaw you panic okay you know you know that that you may not go in and what should i do because i have already given the relaxant but the good part was only succamethonium was given i depend again the plane with propofol tried to mask ventilate but because of maybe panic my hands are now starting to pain what to do call for help so i called a surgeon surgeon comes in running very good surgeon i by the time i just passed the igel and i could ventilate very easy then what what do you want me to do uh, doctor this is a breast surgery so i think we can go ahead with it and he was confident enough and then we could go ahead and get the surgery done with it so there was no need to actually tube the patient but at back of mind i was always fearful what if she goes what can i do what further can i do but again the bougie and the things were still available and then from then on when i gave muscle relaxant everything was fine i could ventilate and the surgery went on uneventful but this can happen even in unanticipated regular cases now what is uh, plan b so you continue oxygenation now most of the times we forget to think about oxygenation or deepening the plane of anesthesia and then patient becomes tight and it makes the laryngoscopy more difficult so as time passes and our mind gets uh, blocked all these things come into a vicious cycle and you could land up in a soup because of that so oxygenation minimum 15 liters per minute or continuous nasal oxygen nation is a good plan uh, some people i have seen here especially in this part of the world they just as soon as the patient comes inside the ot whether it is anticipated unanticipated anything they will just put nasal prongs and start oxygenation at 2 liters per minute by the time we attach monitors and everything because baseline vitals are already taken so this helps in uh, by new some time irrespective of uh, whatever the situation is anticipated or unanticipated so it is a good practice guideline with oxygen is not going to be wasted it will help you over uh, if you are especially if you are alone and help is far away and uh, as i said depth of anesthesia uh, is very important consideration and uh, i have really seen some people struggle with giving inadequate doses of muscle relaxant and then saying on scopy i couldn't see anything 
So before you uh, have a second attempt, ensure that you are keeping the depth, keeping adequate doses, and there should be some change between your first and the uh, second attempt of whatever. If, if you are trying to introduce a SGD or you are trying to bag and mask, or we will come to it like what. So some change has to be uh, there between your attempts. Otherwise, there is no point. If you are not successful, that means either the position was wrong or the patient was not deep enough or uh, one of those things. Your blade was incorrect. You have used a smaller blade of laryngoscope, one of those things. These are uh, different types of uh, supraglottic devices from the classic to the uh, or again. Again, images of LMAs and IGELs for uh, in the last airway workshop, I was really uh, surprised to see some students who are in A of different airways. So familiarize yourself with the uh, whichever airway uh, supraglottic devices are available. Please, please make use of them and familiarize with the insertion techniques. IGEL is very freely available. Uh, I am sure about that. And uh, please try and using them in regular patients. These are intubating LMAs. Uh, they are going to be there in the next part of your plan, but because this is LMA, I have put it in this. Again, uh, about intubating LMA, I will revise again. Try, if you are not used to use it in a routine, do not attempt in an emergent situation. Anything which you are not used to, try for the things you know. Even if you know two things properly, do them properly, maybe you will sail through. But don't go for untried things, new things in this new scenario. Entry airway exchange catheter, another. So what should you do? Like I said, will you wake up the patient? But if your surgeon is okay with it and you are okay with it and there is no spasm or such things, then you can continue with it. Or like I said, continue or intubate via supraglottic device or try a tracheostomy when there is still time in hand before any. Uh, so if it's a major surgery like head face neck surgery where they are planning to do something where Anyways, uh, they were planning to tube the patient or put the patient to take your me with major dissection of face and neck. Then uh, this could be the plan. But I, as I said, it was we are discussing it for unanticipated events in a face and neck surgery. You would be anticipating it. Okay. So what is again plan C? See everywhere you can see it is says call for help. Call for help. And. Uh, Oxygenation, again, emphasis on oxygenation continuously. Should you postpone the surgery? If it is non-emergent surgery, not, uh, then wait, call for help. Think of two heads thinking be is better than a single head. And see if you can have the improved bag and mask ventilation, whether your neuromuscular blockage is adequate. If it fails, then last but not least is your plan D. So it is very invasive uh, plan. If you have not tried it, and again, as I said, you are going to try it like I myself have tried it only in the model in the airway workshop. So, and that is not adequate. So personally, I, I am not confident of FONA approach, but it is okay to be rehearsed with the steps in the mind hmm, as to how we are going to go about it. Now, this is the Vortex model we have been uh, listening about and uh, too much in vogue. There is good video. It is by uh, two Australian doctors. Now, what they say is, this model, uh, this is plan A, plan B, and plan C. They can move in any direction, but see that you are sailing up. The lower, lowermost part of this uh, here, uh, the lowermost part is the uh, surgical airway. You can uh, stay in any of these three. Either you try ventilating with SGD, if you are able to tube the patient best, even if a simple bag mask is fine. But try and uh, be above this part in the vortex. Do not go spiraling down and down to the point that you have to do a surgical airway. Then they suggest that in each part, at least you will do three attempts uh, so that you are not spiraling down. But in the three attempts, there should be some change, either a position uh, change, head and neck change, or a head tilt chin lift change. Here, maybe you will use a different uh, blade, again with different position of the neck, a different device. But you are not familiar with any of that. Uh, I will not even suggest for you to ask for uh, to help wake up the patient if it is still possible to wake the patient up and think of a plan and then proceed. You know, so this is a vortex vortex model. So what does a difficult airway card look like uh, in near our uh, resources setup? So this would be a, a airway uh, CMAC. 
and um, each compartment would be labeled plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. On the right side, you can see that there is a checklist and the, our technicians are doing it. The other side is mounted in, in a bougie. You will say, oh, this is too fancy and very difficult. I, and I agree to it. It is not possible in smaller nursing homes. And if you are a freelancer, this is not possible at all to carry this trolley. So what I suggest is a kit. You can compartmentalize this kit in the form of plan A, plan B, plan C and D. And this kit, if it is with you, it's still fine. It can be kept in your car or you can carry it with you to the nursing home uh, every time. Or you can make one own in the, each nursing home. So you can see this is a simple drawer of uh, a machine or station workstation with drugs needed here. And uh, the uh, you can see the LMAs and the head ring. Like I said, at least in the attempts in that Vortex model, there should be some change. Some of you may be comfortable using a pillow, some others may be using a head ring, but some nursing homes do not have a head ring. Then all these factors should not hamper your uh, attempts at the airway at all the times. So what is not available, try and make those things available at those times in those situations. Another view of the SCART from then one more trolley. Yeah. You can arrange it as per your assistance. Like if you are a frequent visitor to one nursing home, then make all the staff available. Madam ka GA trolley ye hai. This is her GA trolley. So all of them know that in case of difficulty, they have to go to this box or they have to go to this place where even your small video laryngoscope could be placed and easily made available. So no, there is no confusion. And even as Dr. Pallavi had suggested, there should be clear instructions in case of uh, such a situation. See, if the car, a kit is in your car, tell them, go to my car and get the kit from the dicky. It's as simple as that. Some people may not understand. So tell where your car is parked. And believe me, it takes time. Like once I had asked for a bougie and it take, uh, took like 15 minutes to get the bougie from the car. And it is real. I'm not joking because it's across the street. He could not go down, blah, blah. He could not identify what the bougie is. Again, I will accept it is my mistake. I have not trained the people. Sometimes it is difficult for you to carry everything with you when you are going up. But then oxygenation at that time and waiting for some time saved the day for me. Okay. Uh, now, uh, soft skills, again, I will talk on. These are the charts which are easily available on, on the internet, which you can copy and keep it with you for the uh, things. So strategies. Now, uh, imagine yourself. Uh, how, how do I plan? It is unanticipated. It was unanticipated. How I plan, how I plan is uh, I imagine myself going for a case which is straightforward and uh, close my eyes and think myself to be in a situation with the worst possible help that you could get at that particular place if you are familiar with the place. Then if you happen to uh, face it, how will you do it? So even mock, mock drills, mock imagination in your mind and in what situations. So have some friends who are on your speed dial and who will come and help you or train the people whom you work with regularly. There is this interesting, uh, not interesting case. I was called for a lab collet. Uh, the surgeon is very famous. I was a new anesthetist and I had my, my coil blade with me. And we used to, as I said, saxamethonium we used to give. And uh, everybody is looking at you with those staring eyes, whether she can intubate. This is a new anesthetist. Rest of the equipment check, my uh, equipment check and everything was perfect. Uh, as soon as I asked them to give scolent, which has happened. And I do a scopy and they, they, they are like, Madam, if you can't see, leave it, leave it, leave the case. As like, what? Why are you even troubling me? Let me see. Let me do a second attempt. The patient is not relaxed. Wait. Give some more propofol. No, 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 no. Sir will not like it. So what do you do in that case? It is not a question of ego. You cannot push. If the people around you are not trusting enough, maybe you are new to that place. Let it go. Let the patient start breathing. Oxygenate till that time. And uh, if they're not willing, uh, let the case go and say, okay, if the uh, Cormac Leone score was this and shift it to other place. There is no harm or there is no insult. But if... Uh, you have your moral down and you say, or you have your ego to high and say, no, no, I want to go ahead with this. Let us do it. It, it is not the right thing to do. So go with the flow. Think how it works. There is no point insisting that you have to do the case. It's okay if you are not able to do the case. 
so one acronym that we have to remember all the time is nasal oxygen during effort securing a tube or airway so uh, what it does is high flow nasal oxygen or simple nasal oxygen as i said it will buy you time during these uh, events and it will uh, help, like delay the spiraling of that uh, uh, vortex view so you are not going to the bottom of the vortex you are still trying to be in the green zone as long as the saturation is on your side and as uh, uh, rightly dr prashiv has already said that co2 is not an issue but oxygenation is more important so please please continue with the oxygenation during all your efforts and maybe you will be able to buy time by the help time help comes another important fact that i would like to tell you is even it is more easier said than done in your freelance help will at least take half an hour depending on the traffic depending on the availability of other anesthetists and how far it is uh, he or she is so all these things are practical considerations you said so call for help happens in a minute but nobody is sitting and waiting they are ready okay she is going to call me for help and let me just be ready and rush and two minutes help will arrive doesn't happen that way unless unless there is somebody doing some case in the adjacent theater or you are overlapping or something but it's all luck and do not count on luck for that time wake up the patient if it is still possible to do to before it spirals down okay so uh, some take home points is uh, it is unexpected uh, things can happen uh, experienced help may not be available as i said special equipment may not be available general anesthesia you have already given so wake up maybe you have given the long acting muscle relaxant and in then in that case see if you can ventilate the patient sugamadex if you have given uh, rocurolim sugamadex may or may not be available or uh, cisatracurium or atracurium if you have given again then you will have to still give some time for ventilation so ventilate with whatever ways and means you can till you can think of some alternative methods maybe front of neck access maybe call the surgeon in time until that time continue nasal oxygenation try bag mask ventilation and maintain the depth of anesthesia as in lighter planes if you are maneuvering the airway the situation can worsen by patient going into laryngospasm Hmm? if it is emergent case it is still going to be worse because the fasting status may not be you may not be sure of that so there are multiple things that will come into play depending on whether it is a emergency emergent or non emergent case non emergent case please please safely go ahead and uh, wake the patient up you you know live to fight another day wait think maybe plan properly and think what went wrong and then you can still uh, go ahead with the case for a emergent semi emergent uh, can may be a fetal distress also but as it's like a wide and huge topic of discussion and controversy but of course mother's life is first so wake up the patient and wait wait for another time till you are sure of what your plan is and uh, try and avoid being distracted like many of times uh, i have seen uh, uh, some i will not take names they are like okay aaj share market mein kya chal raha hai so if you are thinking about share market and no this doesn't look like a difficult airway and suddenly an encounter a difficult airway uh, it, you are calling for a catastrophe so at least for 5 minutes think what you are going to do always 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 make it a habit what is your plan a what is your plan b what is your plan d are you going to do the case in sgd or are you planning to go, to go ahead and tube the patient or what is your plan or a tiva but don't don't start a case it takes a two minutes by the time you are pre oxygenating or giving nasal oxygen to think about what is to be done it is always a good idea uh, to educate all around you even a small debriefing uh, say for instance uh, xyz i am going to plan a tube for this patient this is the tube this is the drug this is what i am going to give if this doesn't happen this is the laryngeal mask airway is it okay am i clear Uh, if not you know what is a buji a quick revision is going to save you even a thousand times you do this revision the hundred time when actually it may happen all your people around you are going to be ready and like yes madam you have told this to us so make it a habit to uh, if the people are new if you are going to the same place of course they know what you are going to do but still we i make it a routine to discuss a uh, what i am going to do for that particular case including the drugs and medications today i am going to put a, a i gel for this patient my drug would be remifentanil infusion propofol and that is what i verbalize so make it a habit to verbalize even though you are familiar or unfamiliar this will help everybody uh, to 
you know they will feel that they are important to and they will help you these are the people who are going to help you then uh, some take home uh, messages is like be familiar with alternative methods of intubating techniques and use them regularly do not use it for the first time in emergency so how can you make your life interesting ah uh, this doctor comes every day he will come he will give uh, propofol scolin put the tube then we are sitting the case finishes and then goes okay why not try something uh, in a case where everything seems fine okay today we will use this bougie come let me show you how to use it this is how i keep my day interesting so try and make your day interesting every day okay today we will talk about a blog but that also you have to make day interesting for everybody give them a chance to use their brain what do you think okay so last time you have seen this do you think this is better or that is better you know and really believe me i have seen it they say okay with bougie some patients have this <clears throat> but when you are doing it is not happening then we have to tell them okay i put a jelly on the tube uh, tip of the bougie be gentle uh, give adequate relaxation patient should not be struggling with you and if you educate them regularly or make it a point to talk to them uh, things are going to be easier for you and I, as it is unanticipated you never know when it happens so preparing is the only thing that is in your hand and uh, the 2022 asa guidelines uh, uh, the gist of that guidelines is that the guidelines are only for management they will not tell tell you how to educate or how to train or they are not going to give you any certifications they'll give you different alternatives a very important thing is awareness of passage of time as pallavi had rightly mentioned about the stopwatch on it it is not available at most of the places make it a habit it to start the stopwatch when you have given a muscle relaxant this feature is available in most of your monitors or in your workstations so you have a visual uh, clue of, as to what is happening and how much time has elapsed even in a routine case this will uh, help you to know how much time do you require to intubate a routine patient and you are uh, trying to beat your own score that way so if you are good at it you will know okay that means it was difficult or not difficult so as you go make it a habit to look of time and in this passage of time is important especially when you are limiting the number of attempts and i will try this i will try that so number of attempts increase the secretions will increase the blood will increase there will be trauma there will be edema and you will go down the vortex so try and avoid it be gentle all these steps you are going to revise as i said you are going to re revise and also these guidelines have very good uh, recommendations for extubation of these patients should you encounter a unanticipated or anticipated difficult airway like uh, you would be skeptical so please go through them and it, it will help you so thank you Uh, thank you, Mega. You can stop sharing your screen and uh, we can have uh, further discussions uh, on this. I think you covered uh, most aspects of uh, uh, unanticipated difficult airway. Uh, I think it's a very scary situation for a lot of people. But if they have a plan A, B, C, D, then I think uh, that gives them confidence to manage a unanticipated difficult airway. But obviously, it requires uh, all the equipment, required resources. And uh, that's what is uh, limited, isn't it? That's why you're talking about limited resources in uh, people who are working on their own, freelancers. Yes. Um, I'm not a freelancer. I've not faced this kind of situation. So I would actually ask uh, others who actually work as freelancers to uh, have your input into this situation. Absolutely. Uh, sir. I have a few points here. Yep. Uh, the first commonest uh, problem that we all face, whether you are in a small nursing home or an institute, is your conventional laryngoscope goes in and the light bulb goes off. I think each and every one of us has faced that. Um, that was one. Second point that was taught to me by one of my uh, professors was at every single workshop, you know, get your hands dirty, go in there, try each and every gadget that is available. Like for me, I used to say, I do not have a VLS with me. So what is the point? I learn on the stores and this and that. And I don't have access to it. It's a Okay. So I, I do not have access to a hi-fi gadget. So what is the point? Why should I learn? So here it was, you know, learn on a dummy. 
make your mistakes on a dummy so that when you have a real life human being in front of you, you're prone to make lesser mistakes. It is not to say that you will learn completely, but you will make lesser mistakes. Having said that, I would ask everyone to be comfortable with a normal intubation. You know, if you have a normal, you are not anticipating a difficult airway, a so-called anticipated easy airway. Use newer gadgets on these patients. Use newer techniques on these patients. Do it. Attain a certain, a fair level of comfort and confidence in using it with normal patients in non-emergency settings. So then when you face an emergency setting or an unanticipated problem, that is when, you know, you have something known as a muscle memory. So your brain and your body automatically springs into action and you're able to deal with it. And uh, till then, before that, every single time, ask for help. Now, DSP has made a beautiful point, you know, it's bet best to ask for help uh, at the early stages rather than shouting for help at the end. Uh, another thing, uh, beautiful, uh, this point that Megha mentioned was a stopwatch. Now, the only time I used a stopwatch in the OR was when they were doing bone cementing during uh, replacement surgery. Uh, but yeah, now I have actually decided to give it back to my surgeons who complain about the time taken for anesthesia. So the moment my muscle relaxant goes in, my stopwatch is started. So then I start targeting the time between my intubation to their incision. And that is the time I throw back at them. So yeah, I can definitely extend it for um, a difficult airway algorithm as well. And the last point I want to say is on self-audit. After every such catastrophe that has happened, every such mishap that has happened, it is a good idea to, you know, sit down with the entire team over a cup of coffee or tea or whatever and debrief the entire team. Find out what went wrong. Find out what could have been done better for this patient. Talk, find out, get inputs from each and every member of the team. Like, for example, now, as Megha said, I even I do that, you know, I speak to my uh, team that is there before surgery. This is the procedure. We have the surgical safety che checklist. So when that is going on, along with that, the plan of anesthesia is also decided. So depending on whether I have one staff nurse or I have four people in the OR, there is designated job given to every team member. You are going to push the drugs. You are going to maintain the airway with me. You are going to only have an eye on the monitor and nothing else. So if there is only two of us, then she keeps an eye on the monitor and I will do whatever else is that is required. And I might call the surgeon for help if needed. And uh, at the end of the uh, the problem that has occurred, you know, we sit down and we bond over a cup of tea or something and then discuss what went wrong and what exactly are the steps that we would take to uh, try and not get ourselves into this uh, pickle, you know, next time. And uh, yeah, I think that works wonders when you're dealing with similar situations again. So everybody has a fair idea of what is to be done and how we can improve the next time. I guess that uh, was uh, a nice uh, input Sorry, sorry, me. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Who is that? Yeah, I'm Dr. Kai. Oh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kai. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Megha made a very uh, valid point about educating the theater personnel. Maybe in freelancer practice, uh, you are alone many times or there. Like in our uh, institutional situations, we are there. There are so many people to help you around. And but still, when you are alone there, uh, the educating your theater personnel, maybe your technicians or maybe ward boys or nurses in the theater is very important. One of the small incidents I will like to quote when we used to pre oxygenate the um, patient with open circuit, with mask and head drink valve and then back mount and all those. And we used to assemble that circuit before taking up the case. That's at one time, in one patient, I was trying to pre oxidate the patient, and I found that there was no head brink wall in between the mask and my corrugated tube. So I asked one of the uh, OT technicians there to get the head brink wall. And he didn't know, obviously, about what is the head brink wall. He went uh, somewhere in the other theaters and he got head ring for me. So this is very important in many situations when you need something and you ask for something and that person uh, should exactly know what you want at that time. So every time when you go to the theater, educating your uh, theater personnel is very important and it helps you in difficult situations. Mega made a very valid point about this. Thank you, Mega. Yeah. <clears throat> 
I think uh, uh, this might be actually discussed in training and as well as in human factors by Uma, which will be our next lecture. Uh, I think uh, what yes, we, have, sir. Yeah, we have team brief uh, before we start. And uh, also we are very particular on what you need, what are the needs of surgeons, what are the need of the, thing, of the anesthetist, of the staff. Everything is part of the... Uh, uh, team brief and it is actually on a paper it's a paper exercise so everything is recorded yes, um, besides this i think it's very all uh, very important to let your OD, whoever is your assistant know what you require for each case don't assume and uh, we have printed i don't know what happens in other places but we have a printer list uh, what uh, we do is uh, especially who are the uh, you know, the, uh, your, we have ODPs, we call ODPs. If they are not, you know, familiar with your techniques or, or what you do, uh, put them on the paper, write them. For this case, I need this size eye gel or I need this tube, size in undertaker tube. I'm planning to intubate, not intubate, whatever it is. It should be very clear from the very beginning. So they are also prepared. You need to give them time to prepare. It's not just your side, but also to uh, them for preparation. Yes, sir. Uh, one point which I would like to make here is every potential uh, intubation or difficult airway is also a potential extubation. So yeah. the same kind of preparedness and uh, availability of difficult airway equipment and uh, airway management needs to be there till the end of the case. So sometimes uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, lacking at the end of the case, which can again lead to problems. It can lead to a reintubation and again a difficult airway, a lot of issues at that point in time. Absolutely. I think um, I actually cut down that part and Kala was going to discuss that part. Uh, she had prepared on the extubation, safe extubation. But I think safest extubation is the same as what if you can get the yes. patient. Uh, yes. It was before you try to induce anesthesia and uh, you know get prepared for intubation. So, so you need to get the patient to the same level. Uh, okay. One of the commonest, uh, I think, issues, again, uh, which is not stressed much, is uh, inadequate reversal of neuromuscular blockade. That's the commonest. So, you know, if you're not monitoring the neuromuscular blockade and, and you, you give the reversal at the wrong place and patients does have an attempt and you exhibit the trachea, you can actually go, pro, you know, very wrong in that. So I think that preparation for exhibition should start as soon as you get the tube in and you are settled down and they need to start planning uh, what is your extubation technique going to be? Are you going to just leave the patient with intubation and move the patient to intensive care or where the patient has, uh, you know, can be extubated at their own leisure? Or are you going to extubate the trachea and then move to another setting because you have got another patient waiting for you? So that again, sir, it should be part of your plan. Sir, in a low resource setups, the extubation planning is in the PAC itself. Yeah. yeah, we discuss with the patient, with the surgeons, everyone as a team. We discuss about extubation also. That is yeah. also a deciding factor of whether we can do the surgery there or not. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have to reverse the neuromuscular blockage, that's the best technique ever. <laughs> I actually hate I hate neuromuscular blockage. I can I can tell you that much. I don't don't like them at all. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I think we should move forward. I yes. think I'm uh, looking forward to actually hearing about the uh, human factors in the difficult airway. Uh, it's I a very, very important, important area. And I would uh, request Uma uh, yes, to sir. give us a talk on human factors in difficult airway. Yes, Before sir. We... Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, is the screen visible, sir? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. All right. Uh, a very good afternoon to all of you and uh, special thanks to uh, Shiv sir and the entire team of uh, this uh, beautiful symposium. Uh, and to include such an uh, innovative topic, human factors uh, training for difficult airway management. This is extremely important. Uh, because this is quite uh, forgotten, neglected, and sometimes uh, taken uh, for granted. 
so um, this has to be inculcated right from our training days from the day one when we enter the anesthesia practice or let us say when we enter the medical field because we are not dealing with files and uh, machines we are dealing with live human beings so we cannot uh, we have no scope for error because uh, that can lead to fatal complications so the background of this human factors training comes from the similarity between airway management and aviation industry so what is said is that uh, an error if it is not recognized or managed it can gradually or quickly transform into a catastrophic event which can lead to complete loss of life or irreversible damage so the same thing which can happen with an aviation industry leading to an accident and crashing of the aircraft and loss of lives of the people traveling in the plane and the crew the same catastrophic event can happen if we do not recognize the various pitfalls in the airway management which we are doing and that can result in airway failure consequences which can be either irreversible and or fit so this is basically described as the swiss cheese model for error meaning that all the lines in the swiss cheese has to have to be in the same line all the holes or the errors have to be in the same line for an accident to become uh, fatal so but that is possible only and only if a series of errors occur which are not rectified and which are not uh, managed properly so the same thing has to be avoided in the airway management and that is done by training human factors and it has been known that human factor training is the uh, is uh, can result in significant improvement in airway management and this human factor is responsible for serious adverse events if not uh, properly trained so the various human factors which can result in problems are either system failure or unfamiliarity with the environment or the equipment or failure of the team you see in airway management it is actually not an individual person who is responsible for the failure or success of securing the airway it is the team so the entire team should work in tandem for achieving a common objective and the safety factors include the avoidance of errors the common errors and the pitfalls and if there are any errors identification of the errors at an early stage uh, at a stage where there is no irreversible damage and which can be easily tackled and if at all this error has occurred then mitigating the consequences and saving the life of the patient so that is what is the background and i shall go further on this so definition of human factors is the environmental organizational and job factors and the human and individual characteristics which influence behavior at work in a way which can affect health and safety so um, now what basically i would like to emphasize in this is that one must work as a team there must be institutional and uh, organizational protocols and guidelines which must be strictly followed and all the team members must have a common objective and uh, behavior at work which is towards safety there should be an attitude towards patient safety which is very important and various audits especially done in the western world have proven that uh, poor human factor uh, factors have contributed to 40% of complications which are occurring in the operative uh, environment so the proper strategy is not only uh, to form an airway management plan that yes i will intubate or put an lma but also in planning and the planning starts in the pre operative area itself when the primary psc is being done and then explaining to the surgeon and the patient and the team members it is very important to take the team as a whole and prepare it before the patient comes to the theater and a team briefing as well as debriefing this was already highlighted in the previous lecture that we need to not only brief our team but also debrief that after an incident or after an event what went right what went wrong and what we can do to improve further so that is what is very important and conduct of the actual airway management should follow the standard guidelines for securing the airway 
the human factor training goals are basically to circumvent difficulties in three major aspects of difficult airway management which are which can be either anatomical physiological and situational the anatomical difficult airway characteristics can be uh, um, uh, for example the patient is having a thick neck or a beard or uh, edentulous patient then physiological difficulties it's a pregnant woman or an um, elderly compromised patient and situational difficulty for example when we are working in low resource settings or when we are working in camps or where we are working in remote areas or more importantly even in institutional huge institutional setups when we are working outside the ot environment you see working outside the ot environment has always been stressful for any anesthesiologist even the most experienced will feel the heat when he or she is asked to give anesthesia outside his usual domain or his usual place of work so uh, situational awareness or the situational familiarity with the uh, area as well as the patient and the surgeon or the uh, main uh, physician involved in the treatment of the patient is very very important for a, a successful airway management and you must also try each and every methodology available to improve the airway management skills of yourself and your team so basic as well as advanced traditional training is uh, recommended and human interaction and coordination that should be well oiled it should be like a well oiled machine working in complete sync so that there are no bottlenecks and no ifs and buts the plan should be clear to all the members that now if i am unable to put in the lma i will try the endotracheal tube or vice versa whatever is being planned for that particular patient and they have to be in complete agreement with the team leader and the um, most important aspect in this is predefining the role set to each and every member of the team and delegation of the roles to be made clear and uh, a team briefing to be done to explain the roles and to explain the plans a close loop communication is what is recommended this is a very very important aspect because the close loop communication means that if the team leader says that give iv propofol 100 mg the person who is responsible for giving the intravenous induction agent repeats his order or repeats his request and gives in the drug and says that i have given 100 mg intravenous propofol iv now so now this forms and the and the person who is giving the uh, request says yes okay thank you so now this forms a closed loop communication wherein the uh, the message has been clearly uh, passed on to the person who has to follow that particular procedure and after the procedure or after giving the drug the person or the team uh, member reverts back and says that he has completed his task and the leader accepts that yes thank you so much you have done the work so now that is what is important to know and that is also important for documentation that yes this particular thing has been done and formulation of the plans now this formulation of the plan should not be done once the patient is on the table or after giving of iv anesthetics most of the times i have seen that once the patient is on the table and iv uh, sedatives have been given then the anesthesiologist decides that oh i don't think we can put in a tube we will put in a supraglottic device no these plans have to be made in the pre operative area itself and you can even make a pictorial diagram in your pre anesthetic chart explaining to the patient and telling his relatives or him that this is what we'll be doing and even uh, the surgeons can be explained that look this is a difficult airway we may require a surgical access uh, uh, in this patient so the appropriate consent and explanation has to be taken so then the surgeon will also know what is there in your mind and what are the problems which you may face or else suddenly if you say that oh no we are unable to secure the airway and the patient will need immediate ic admission it comes as a rude shock not only uh, to yourself but also to the surgeon and to the family members who are totally unprepared for any eventuality of this sort then documentation and feedback i i would uh, strongly suggest that we all should be excellent in documentation and special training in documentation of the vital aspects of airway management need to be given 
Simulation-based training and crisis management workshops are excellent tools for improving the human factors training. And most important is to limit the background noise. This is also important. This has actually been taken from the aviation industry, just like the uh, previous slide, which I showed. Now coming to the vortex concept, I will not be going into the details of this because this has already been covered well by Dr. Mega, but the human factors training has been given a lot of importance in this because they follow a uniform standardized language of uh, plans and airway management protocols, which have to be followed in um, sequence. And that training, the training for following that particular safety sequence is very important. So we need to understand that any airway can become difficult uh, because of um, various circumstances or patient related factors. So we need to plan and keep the airway cart, difficult airway cart and all the equipment ready and have a mentality to understand that, yes, even I can go wrong and I may need help at any point in time. So that is very important and very nicely uh, explained by this. Actually, all this came up after the Elaine Bromley case. Um, and uh, that was a very unfortunate uh, event that triggered a multitude of um, patient safety protocols in airway management. And that is where the human factors in uh, airway management has been given uh, a greater push. So there are various specific factors in complex uh, airway management, and those include uh, a strong uh, and a very accommodative strong as well as accommodative leadership, teamwork, excellent and progressive teamwork, situational awareness. This is very important. You must be knowing your limitations, your uh, strengths and your weaknesses. Um, then decision making. Now, decision making, as I told you, has to be done from the pre-operative area. But yes, if you are landing into a problem at the time of airway management, you should be in a position to change the decision towards patient safety in preference to anything else. Then coming to followership and communication, I shall be coming to it a little later, but remember that adequate and effective communication between the team members is mandatory for any uh, successful airway management. Now coming to the leadership. <clears throat> now uh, leadership, uh, this is uh, a very interesting topic because there can be several ego clashes and there can be several differences of opinion uh, between uh, the uh, team members. So the leader has to be the catalyst to dissolve all these differences and to uh, act as a main buffer and to concentrate on one particular common goal. And that is patient safety. And leader will usually be the most experienced anesthesiologist and formulate the airway management plans and communicate to the team members so that everyone is on the same page. So everyone knows that, yes, in this particular patient of, let us say, uh, cervical spine instability or fusion, what we will be doing, we will be doing a wake fiber optic bronchoscopy via the nose. So everyone knows that, okay, now this is going to be a nasal intubation. The patient is going to be awake. We have to keep the fiber optic bronchoscope ready. We need to prepare the patient. We need to prepare the uh, difficult airway equipment and we need to be mentally prepared for any eventuality because this is a difficult airway, which we know. But the problem comes in unanticipated difficult airway. So in that situation also, your plans and allocated roles have to be taken care of. That can be done by identifying the limitations in the skill mix and to be situationally aware. Right, teamwork. As I told you, anesthesia is a teamwork. It is not a single person who is responsible for the success. And this is especially so in airway management. So there is one uh, definition of team, uh, which I would like to share with you. It is a distinguishable set of two or more people who interact dynamically, interdependently and adaptively towards the common and valued goal, who have seen assigned specific roles or functions and who have a limited lifespan membership. So uh, this uh, definition uh, is uh, important to understand because it dwells into three important aspects, dynamic, interdependent and adaptive and common valued goal. So all these four aspects are vital uh, parts of the definition, which I have already explained. Now, both team briefing and debriefing is important, but in the briefing, you must give opportunity for the team members to ask questions and to clear them. 
Also ensure that the team is aware of all the management plans and have a uh, realistic expectation. Now coming to situational awareness. Situational awareness is perception of the elements in the environment within a volume of time and space, the comprehension of their meaning and projection of their status in future. And this is very, very important in airway management, especially outside the operation theater or in resource limited settings where you need to be very, very good at managing the uh, team members, at managing your limited airway equipment and at maximizing your skill in airway management. So um, loss of situational awareness is one of the most common uh, recurring feature in adverse events. And uh, this, is, uh, this can be uh, seen in a trauma uh, team resuscitation wherein the trauma team leader uh, he maintains a hands-off approach. What do you mean by a hands-off approach? Hands-off approach means the trauma team leader is actually not participating in any uh, active uh, intervention. He's neither uh, responsible for managing the airway nor giving the drugs nor documentation. His uh, work is to stand near the patient and give instructions and to see whether these instructions are being adequately followed and documented and the patient is safe. So that is what is a very important and in resource limited as well as manpower limited settings, such kind of a situation is difficult to get, but that is said to be ideal, the trauma team scenario. And this is what we generally follow in our ATLS advanced trauma life support protocols for airway management. There are three stages of situational awareness. First is gathering information, which I already told you, adequate history taking, examination, especially the airway examination, then supplemental investigations, which may be required. For example, you may require a, a neck x-ray or some other investigation. So all of these should be displayed or kept ready in the OT. Interpret the information correctly. You should not you know, interpret the information incorrectly. For example, you should not interpret a, a patient to be having a a normal airway when the patient may actually have an unanticipated difficult airway. So that is what is very important. Anticipating future states. For example, while doing endotracheal intubation, you cause trauma to the uh, airway and there is bleeding. So this mistake has to be anticipated that yes, if there is an anticipated difficult airway, there could be trauma to the airway and I need to keep the suction on and I need to keep my plan B ready that yes, now I cannot intubate like this. I may need a video laryngoscope or maybe a fiber optic bronchoscope or some other uh, airway adjunct to uh, enhance my uh, skills. Now coming to decision-making. Now decision-making is done in such a uh, excellent, should be done in such an excellent manner to minimize errors. So that all kinds of errors which lead to an unsafe situation in a patient are avoided and hence, this is uh, one of the most important aspects and a detailed preoperative patient assessment uh, is uh, very vital to uh, taking the right decisions. The clinician should identify potential difficulties and problem areas and break the error chain and weigh the risk benefit ratio of each and every airway manipulation or method you will be using in that particular patient. And once an airway management decision is made and a plan A or a plan B is formulated, continue to reevaluate continuously that yes, if I fail, should I go on to plan B or should I go on to plan C or should I uh, call for help and uh, declare a CICO situation? So this is what is very, very important. And uh, you should have a clear plan for stepping in when you are giving the airway management to your trainee or to your junior who uh, is managing the airway at that point in time that you should know that when you should take over the case. Followership. A follower is defined as anyone not acting in the position of leader and responding to organizational actions. He is actually an active uh, team member and not a passive team member and he is one of the most important uh, member of the team. And you should assign the roles to all the followers in anticipation with good support and communication skills and closed feedback loops. And this feedback loop for closed communication is very important. This I already uh, explained. And uh, it should be, uh, the, the instruction should be given in clear cut uh, message or language or uh, gestures as completely understood by that team member. Communication. Now, uh, most of the problems in, I would say, not only airway management, in life, 
also occur because of poor communication so the communication aspect is extremely important communication to the patient to the surgeon to the team members uh, to uh, yourself you should actually uh, tell yourself that oh yes now my plan a is going to fail i have to immediately think about plan b so that internal and external communication has to be in sync and the communication flows from the team leader to the other team members and um, the after introduction the team is reminded of the individual levels of training and competencies and tasks are allocated and discussion of the potential problems and solutions are also told and clarification of the team leaders mental model and lb plans is nicely and completely discussed sometimes time is a constraint in all these things so uh, we must keep as minimum as possible uh, the number of team members uh, in emergency airway situations not only uh, to minimize uh, the noise level but also to avoid any kind of confusion or external pressure make sure that you are able to um, hear all the monitors especially the spo2 the pulse and uh, the uh, other uh, vital parameters are fully monitored and ensure that uh, the feedback is not lost so um, this is uh, one uh, thing which i uh, found out the nt6 step approach to difficult airway management six vital questions are asked how much time do i have do i have a, a adequate time for a good airway preparation what access is available do i have the oral access or the nasal access or neither of the two and i in the front of the neck access how compromised is the airway do is there an anticipated difficult airway or it is an unanticipated and what facial planes are involved for example if i am dealing with an access the neck access or an oral access what are uh, the uh, problems which can occur and which management plan fits best into the circumstances now this um, has to be done before starting of the case and one question which you must ask yourself can i possibly make the situation worse or better if i am able to make it worse how and how i can prevent it so that is very important please stop and think where are you going wrong or at what point in times you can go wrong there is no uh, ego hassle nothing to feel bad about it uh, failures can happen to anyone even the most experienced of the people and that you need to understand and rectify so if you feel that uh, this i will not be going into the details because this is already being discussed in the uh, previous lectures Uh, the airway team is very uh, vital for uh, success and training has to be given as a team so all the members uh, have to be very well conversant with what the consultant anesthetist or the team leader is comfortable with or doing it on a day to day basis and what is required for that particular patient and they should also arrange as per the number of people available for example if there are six people available or five people available or a fewer number of people available that like who will be giving the drug who will be giving the airway equipment who will be giving the suction who will be uh, calling going out and calling for help who will be available for doing the uh, neck uh, access in case of uh, emergency uh, cannot intubate cannot ventilate situation so all these things have to be planned in advance and the airway team is very very important aspect of human factors training now coming to the three um, kinds of difficulties which need to be identified and each individual points uh, require a specific training and uh, assessment uh, in our day to day uh, practice is number one the anatomical difficulty as i told you each and every patient can have airway difficulty because of anatomical difficulty physiological difficulty or situational difficulty and the uh, anatomical difficulty of course uh, can be tackled by frequent uh, attending of simulation workshops air difficult airway workshops training on mannequins and bedside teaching and observation and following the standard uh, airway uh, guidelines of the country or the institution for example the difficult airway guidelines or the asa guidelines or even the indian guidelines so following on standard protocol because all these guidelines they stress only and only on achieving patient safety on achieving adequate alveolar oxygenation and ventilation so that is what is our role of this so identification of a potential difficult airway identification of any possible 
uh, confounding factors and optimizing both the position and the practitioner's position. Now, uh, so positioning of the patient as well as the person who is going to intubate is very important. If you are standing at a much lower uh, height or a much higher uh, podium as compared to the patient, then it will be difficult for you to bend down or maybe uh, st stick your neck out and uh, looking into the vocal cords. I mean, all these things have to be anticipated in advance. And you should also have rapid airway assessment tools ready in case of emergency situation. Now, coming to the physiological difficulty, this also requires training. You need to do a meticulous preoperative checkup and all these things like the hemodynamic instabilities, cardiovascular reserves, already of deoxygenated patients with uh, cardiac problems and full stomach patients and pregnant women, so uh, children. So all these are high risk situations which you must, in which you must uh, anticipate a difficult airway. And the mind must be tuned in, your, in the direction of uh, managing a difficult airway in such situations. But coming to situational difficulty or situational awareness, which I told you, it is actually very difficult to manage staff who do not always work together. It is very difficult to, uh, you know, uh, gel with them, very difficult to make them understand that this is what you want and this is what is safe for the patient. So that has to be taught how to uh, work as a team, how to take the team members with you and explicitly delegate the roles and tasks and having an excellent coordination and controlling the background noise. But controlling the background noise has always been a problem, especially in busy centers. And um, this has, uh, this I, I would say that has been one of the most difficult aspects that whenever the anesthetist is intubating, the others are least bothered about what is happening and they all, they make all kinds of noises and um, uh, chats. I mean, that is something which, which disturbs uh, not only the person who is intubating, but also the team, it distracts and it can take uh, precious lives. So this, um, I would uh, strongly recommend that a training or um, a protocol has to be done for this. There is a mnemonic called prepare. Uh, I would not be going into the details of this because these are all uh, aspects of difficult airway management. But yes, there has to be specific training, human factors training in understanding uh, that we need to summarize the technical and the non-technical insights into the airway management challenges and be prepared for difficult airway with plan A, plan B and plan C. Uh, so to conclude, uh, the tagline is train together those who work together. Human factors and human errors are major contributors to adverse outcomes. So please uh, think about the human factors and training them and uh, shaping them into the right channel for better patient management. Training in non-technical skills has been shown to improve patient safety and human factor training in drills. Now, uh, these drills have to be regularly followed in each and every institution regularly and at periodic intervals to reduce morbidity and mortality. So like the fire drill and um, CPR drills. So like that, the airway, difficult airway drills can also be uh, done to um, enhance the training and uh, difficult airway management skills. Benefits of human factors, uh, human factors training are multiple. Most important of them include understand uh, the limitations and the fallibility of the various team members, improve team communication and working, develop knowledge and skills, and strategize the error avoidance and effective crisis management. So you see, avoidance of all errors is absolutely impossible, but you can anticipate that, yes, this error can occur. And this is what you will do if this error occurs. And communication, close loop and effective communication and good team dynamics is what is going to give you success. Pre-delegation of team member roles uh, is what uh, is important uh, to understand that that will lead to uh, improved success. Now, uh, this is what, uh, this is one uh, guideline by the uh, Difficult Airway Society and the Association of Anesthetists. Uh, implementation of human factors in anesthesia guidance for clinicians, departments, and hospitals. So this is uh, freely available uh, in the uh, internet. But yes, various cognitive aids and algorithms and designing of safe working environment, safe drug ampules. For example, this is very important. Uh, several drug ampules uh, look alike. 
so for, if i say that you give a propofol or you give this drug uh, the ampules of various drugs should be different and should be easily identified so there there should be no error in giving the drug the wrong drug or the wrong dose should not be given at any cost so that is also important and designing of medical equipment has to be uh, human friendly in the sense they should uh, be friendly to uh, users at all uh, levels of expertise and uh, non technical skills have to be developed they have to be taught they have to be reinforced they have to be uh, again and again um, in, in, uh, impregnated in the minds of all the team members and investigation of the critical events and adverse events should always be performed uh, without uh, any uh, scope of uh, litigation or any uh, uh, scope of implicating the particular anesthesiologist but just to improve upon the uh, future uh, prospects of airway management and morbidity and mortality meetings should regularly be held as part of the ot uh, meets and human factor education and training should be provided at all levels Uh, of uh, people and teams that work together should train together so that is what i was pressing and staff well being and drain out and uh, staff burn out has to be kept into mind and um, adequate breaks and adequate uh, you know ways of relaxation have to be devised and uh, each anesthetic department should have a human factor lead uh, with appropriate level of training so that is what is uh, recommended and uh, i don't know whether Uh, many of the institutions may or may not have it but yes that is what is recommended uh, thank you so much for your patient listening and i am uh, extremely grateful to dr shiv sir and the organizing team for this uh, opportunity thank you sir jai hind i'll just uh, stop my screen sharing yes thank you ma i don't know why my photo was actually visible on the bottom i couldn't understand actually that. sir i am presenting on the ipad and when you uh, share screen on the ipad your face is not visible okay no i could see yours yours is visible as Achha, well okay okay i on couldn't top, see but mine also I, on the bottom <laughs> on the bottom my photograph was actually coming in there so, yeah that is my privilege <laughs> not a privilege but <laughs> i didn't want to be seen there <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Anyway, anyway, I think um, uh, it's a it's a uh, you know important lecture. Uh, some people might find it boring, but then if we actually look at what we have discussed through the day, it actually covers a lot of aspects of it. I think uh, training as a team may not be possible, and uh, leave alone in a limited resource center, even in hospitals. i get a different odp every time and i get a totally different team every time and that's why brief debrief everything actually comes in as a part of the training but coming to a particular situation i think the communication uh, uh you know who is the team leader is very very who is leading the whole thing and as airway comes in 100% you are the lead uh, there is nobody else in the thing as a consultant anesthetist you are the lead in that uh, one thing second thing is is verbalize okay and when you were saying close loop and um, that is a very very important thing that if you have asked someone to actually give something they need to tell you back verbalize loudly and clearly when you say 100 mg profol they should say 100 mg profol going in so that verbalization is very very important which is not not done i think and actually uh, sir in atls when we teach atls this verbalization yeah. is an important and a mandatory aspect yes if you don't verbalize you are not cleared as even a provider so Absolutely. this particular training has to be imparted for anesthesia also sir for airway management yes yeah it is it is it is um, i think uh, uh, simulation again uh this is i think uh, way back in uh, i i was the airway lead for our department in 2000 for a few years have been 2000 early 2000s when i actually after joined the consultant and one thing what i introduced was a simulator okay simulation in airway management we started simulation airway management where will they will create a scenario so we have a high probability 
simulation center. This they would create a scenario and then the team takes over. So the whole team is there. And you as a team have to go through the situation. And it can do it. You don't need a high simulate, high fidelity simulators for that. You can actually bring the team in. You are now doing something, uh, create a situation and say, let's see how we're going to manage uh, this particular situation. Uh, this is your role. This is your role. So again, uh, like you said, leader is one, but the followers are not passive followers. They're just not listening. They're pretty active and each one has to be have a defined role and that need to be decided uh, within. Uh, if you have a fixed team, I think nothing like it, where you actually have, and you can say that if this situation arises, you are, what are you going to do? Or this is what you're going to do. Uh, it doesn't have to be named. If they are based on position, they can say that, okay, uh, the scrub nurse will do that, or the your orderly will do this, your, uh, I will do this, my assistant <laughs> will do this. So defined roles are actually equally important. Uh, in this kind of situations. Any comments or uh, things from the other faculty, please? Anyone got anything to add <laughs> to this or everything was crystal clear? <laughs> Uma covered everything which you actually thought needed to be covered. <laughs> the most passionate talk of the day from Uma. <laughs> thank you ma'am thank you what she beautifully stressed on was talk 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 so it's like <laughs> plan for your case prepare excellently prepare very well and then yeah. proceed with caution otherwise you end up with a fourth plea that's not preeti that is just pray to god yeah. <laughs> no i think uh, 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 the four p's are very very important i think as Deeraj, i think very clearly mentioned uh, and uh, it was elaborated by uh, Kala that 4P, the first three P's, if you do properly, then execution in the end, you know, it becomes easier. And uh, so it should it be a happen. way of life. Yes, yes it uh, should be. I mean, it shouldn't be uh, you're preparing or something, it shouldn't be in your mind. Each yeah. person in the OT should be in this four P's. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you have to keep that airway devices accordingly. You know, they keep in these boxes. Dabba dabba karke rakhte. So when yeah. we ask, we do not even know whether they have it. Yeah. Uh, and they cannot identify. So, yeah. so know. one more thing I would like to add in that that thing is, is, is the empowerment okay, of your staff. If you uh, tell that, okay, even an orderly could be a very intelligent person, just because an orderly does not mean that he's not educated. A degree is not education. They can be very educated. You can recognize that from their way they work. And you can say, okay, uh, Ram, Shama, whoever you are, or Mossy, whoever it is, they say, you are in charge for this. And can you please be responsible for checking that the equipment is uh, available, it is uh, not out of date, it is uh, you know, whatever it is. You start empowering and people, when they are empowered, uh, they're given a job, they're given a thing, and they then feel responsible for it. I think that is equally important uh, in small centers. I think in India, it's very common to have a huge hierarchy where the lowest rung is actually thought that he's useless person. He can only sweep the floor. No, not necessary there. You can actually, no. when you start giving them that kind of uh, respect and thing, uh, you get back much, much more than uh, what is expected of them. So empower them. Sir, one more factor is human barrier. Yeah. Uh, as you said, hierarchy, uh, some are so, uh, at, you cannot throw attitude on this small, uh, they, they notice the fall in the saturation. They notice that the bougie has fallen down or they notice that the tip of the iron tree adapter has, no, but mm -hmm. they are afraid to speak. You should not yeah. have that kind of environment uh, th that creates barriers between humans. Uh, so uh, this comes uh, in a lot of uh, yeah, we have to be amenable to them so that they speak to us and guide us without fear here again i would stress on soft skills you know appreciation for small little things that they do remember to notice and always thank them for the little things they do when you ask them you know we generally just order them go get this and when they give it to you 
always appreciate thank you or whatever you know if somebody is making coffee just say thank you you make the best coffee in the world all the mauchis in every hospital i go to know that you know they they know that they make the best coffee in the world and suddenly when the mauchi changes and you say it to the other one you know next day she like kya madam usko bhi aisa hi bola but they notice you know these are things that make them more receptive to whatever else you might have to say so yeah and uh, yeah they do as kala said they notice every little thing you do they notice every little thing that is out of place and they also notice your idiosyncrasies they know ye madam ko do laryngoscope chahiye to she has to have two so it is one from the hospital and one she carries her own so there is no no question of one of the laryngoscopes not working and i'm not able to intubate she has to have the uh, mask in that particular place itself and then you have the other colleagues coming back and saying are kya sikhati hai staff ko they are like scolin bola to scolin going in tadak scolin pushed in tadak i will fast that is how the staff speaks to me so if i can train my so called illiterate staff to do these things even a mausi can do that for me you know like mausi chalo push karo tadak so she just pushes it in and she says madam push kiya so that is how you know little little words of appreciation encouragement go a real long way in forming the bond with these guys i think dheeraj has something to add and dr pramod sir yeah. as well. so uh, dheeraj i think you had a hand hand up um, before that i think uh, um, i was going to say something and now i have <laughs> forgot <laughs> but i will i will probably uh, come back to you dheeraj over to you and just couple of points excellent talk madam actually one of the thing which was noted in the fourth uh, national audit po- uh, project was 40% of the cases for yes. difficult airway was because of failure of communication yes, and same yes. dynamic so that's yes. a huge point to notice knowledge yes. people had knowledge and everything but when all this interplay come into picture and now it has been documented evidence that a team dynamics really play into this thing and second point just wanted to mention was like be it a freelancing scenario or be it a hospital or whatever human factors shortage is a universal problem and uh, to make the best use of it is like something one of the major uh, thing for team is to know the strength and weaknesses of the team for example cpr if you have your attendants trained in doing the chest compression that's their strength point you can utilize them the weakness would be you can't uh, ask them to do a airway or a intubation so that's the strength and weakness for airway also single hand ventilation versus double hand bag and mask ventilation just a random example if a person if, as an airway i am able to give a good position with two hands and my uh, attendant or technician is trained to give the oxygen flush along with a continuous ambu bagging that's an excellent help you can have in the resource limited or even for that matter in any scenario so for team also it's very important that we know what are the strengths of our team and what are the weaknesses of the individual members absolutely so i have remembered uh, what i wanted to say <laughs> <laughs> it was about about uh, the uh, thing which uh, i think preeti and kala said is about speak up uh, that uh, they the people around you notice but they are afraid to verbalize right they think you know, oh, they are okay. not educated they are not educated enough to be able to tell you that now this happened in uk Uh, where a medical student actually noticed and he was in theater and said i think that is wrong side kidney you have to go take it out and uh, uh, it, he was not actually you know that didn't happen and patient already had one sided non functioning kidney and they took out a normal kidney the patient died so that created a lot of uh, thing about uh, you know within the theaters uh, empowering people allowing them to speak up giving that and that that is very very important so until as you yourself are going to tell the team it says fine i am the anesthetist i am the consultant but all of you actually have the power to actually tell me if things goes wrong okay and maybe that is something which might save you, uh, the patient's life that is that is what you need to actually tell otherwise they will they will be afraid to tell you and then when it comes to when you're discussing this thing and they say oh maine to dekha tha maine socha aapko bhi pata hoga okay you need to say that some things we do ignore and that's that's what empowerment uh, is about uh, dr Pra kale yeah uh, omar definitely has uh, explained the role of uh, the leader in the operation theater uh, and human factors no doubt about it but i will like to add one thing uh, it is very important for a team leader to avoid interference of non team members 
in your management, whatever plans you have done, plan A, plan B, plan C, and you are going according to your plan with your team members. But suddenly, sometimes it happens that some non-team member comes and interferes in your management. But this has happened with me. Maybe, hello. Maybe Megha uh, was my uh, co-lecturer that time. Uh, one of uh, the case we were reversing. Hello, am I audible? Audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yeah. Mega was my lecturer that time, maybe in neurosurgery OT. We were reversing one uh, spine case and one of the neurosurgeons, great neurosurgeon, uh, he came up, he wanted to take up next case as early as possible. So he was hurrying us, reversing that patient. And patient was just about to come out of anesthesia. And I was about to give a reversal, yet not given. But he came in, he just stand by side and then he pulled out the tube. Do you remember Mega? Yeah. And then we had to actually ask him to get out of the OT and uh, let us manage our own way. This is the thing. This is so interference of these non-team members. However senior surgeon he is, you have to take care of them. Otherwise, it will definitely uh, mess the things. So, uh, secondly, I would like to ask Uma, uh, you have definitely talked about human factors, but what is the role of artificial intelligence in anesthesia? <laughs> uh, That's a big topic on itself. I know, I know. It's a complete yes. topic in itself, yes. artificial intelligence and anesthesia. I think we had a complete session on that uh, in sure. Attack on 2022. Uh, but yes, uh, the uh, use of that in airway management is tremendous. And uh, in a developing country like India, there is a lot to be done uh, and a lot more uh, to be experienced and explored. But uh, yes, what we can think about it is that uh, the training, the training of these young residents uh, into uh, safe airway management using artificial intelligence is what uh, is the, um, you see, I will say the future. Yes. We should work, in, work, work, yes. work uh, toward that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right, right. Yes. yes. Good. Thank you, Uma. Very well Thank done. You, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Chu, sir, you are muted. I'll tell you what artificial intelligence in future will do. <laughs> you will be, you will, I'll, yeah, and, 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 and I'm telling you, you're taking it. It might take time, but this is what is going to happen. Okay. Yeah, the patient will be at least in this thing looking into a camera. Okay. It will actually give instructions, open your mouth, you listen to it as your. <laughs> Air assessment and you say is called tube dalo, is ye dalo, is called you know, likely instruct you to do it. And maybe in the future, like we're talking about robotic, can say even may the direct information might go to the robot and robot will intubate for you. Yes, absolutely. Use a video laryngoscope and intubate for you. But saying, saying that, I think uh, this will likely happen in artificial intelligence where the air assessment will become one of the components. Uh, probably it will uh, standardize the, uh, you know, if I actually ask if you were to do an audit on looking at uh, what mullen party scoring you are giving to a patient and what somebody else given, you'll find a huge difference between them. Okay. Yeah. So similarly, I think this these things will be there. Like, okay, fine. The one thing regarding artificial intelligence, which can be worked on uh, in uh, especially resource limited settings is like, there can be an art, uh, there can be a, a robotically or a artificial intelligence um, you know uh, monitor which yeah. can uh, give uh, verbal or maybe even physical uh, cues to the airway operator that yes now it's the time to change your plan yeah. don't stick yeah. to just um, face mask or lma you you will not be uh, able to succeed go to plan b yeah. I, mean, I mean, that is actually a pat on the back that yes, uh, now is the time to change, don't waste any more time. Because that is very important. That is the place and point where most of us go wrong. We think that no, 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 we'll be able to do, we'll be able to let us try once more, once more with this and with that. But that uh, is the uh, harm doer. So if we can have something about artificial intelligence, which can give prompts uh, yeah. at adequate point in times as per the monitor, uh, for example, desaturation or no ATCO2 or whatever. When we can enter the time from induction, that is what can be done. 
I have a small point uh, to talk or maybe say uh, it's regarding the hierarchy and empowering to talk. I had a the human factor in training is uh, tremendous. I have a scrub nurse who was observing a patient as a Paku nurse and I was inducing in another room. He rushes to me, doctor, the patient is desaturating. I was like, okay, so have you put oxygen? No, I have come to inform you first. Like what kind of informing me? Is it going to help? Is it going to change anything? Ideally, he should have put the mask on and started okay. oxygen even before coming to me. So even if he was so-called trained or higher in hierarchy, it is of no use. So something like a common sense, it is very difficult to put inside somebody. I mean, they are trained on paper, all competence is signed, but what? Well, exactly. I have come and informed you. My job is over. I have informed you. Yeah. Common work. sense is not as common anyway. But so each, each one of us should attempt to take. So I offer uh, to train these PPTs. I uh, uh, take the for the uh, uh, thing in NABH uh, training for the staff. And uh, the hospitals where I don't go, they also call me to train there. So uh, in, it's a small attempt in making all of us on the same page. You know, they have not heard of plan A, plan B, so, but they know things. So they are getting uh, nicely uh, you know, categorized and they are able to think themselves. And even during video laryngoscope, they can uh, help. In the sense, video laryngoscope is very good tool to show them where I'm going and what all is needed. So they are actively participating in that. Yeah, yeah. just to uh, add to what just Kala told, uh, I have a different take on artificial intelligence and the robotic oh. assistance, because this is all what we're going to miss. The robot obviously wouldn't be able to help us guide. So the human touch for the human factors will be lost. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I always say a... that tomorrow I like collapse in one of these OTs. <laughs> My what staff you, should be able to put an SGD for me. What are you forgetting is that uh, when you do a robotic surgery, robot is not doing the surgery. It is actually a surgeon. It's just using robotic Absolutely. Surgery. It's still yeah. a, it's, it's a touch. If he doesn't have a proper touch and he's not able to have that, uh, you know, haptic uh, feedback, he cannot actually do it. So there will always be a human even behind the robot. Yeah. The Da Vinci robot doesn't do surgery on its own. It is still a surgeon. It's just that he's not physically touching the patient. He's uh, guiding the robotic arms. So that, that's the difference. Uh, and and that, I think uh, it's like saying, yeah, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> the robotic arm will do it. Makes no sense in the anesthetic situation. Yeah, yeah. Like Maka, Achal, nobody can replace that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think um, uh, that was a great discussion and thank you Uma, for uh, talking about human factors and uh, I think thank like you, sir. Uh, training training uh, for limited resources in uh, human factors may not be easy uh, time constraints difficult different teams uh, things but I think uh, within your normal working you can introduce a little bit of those factors uh, and easily I think and that, that actually brings us to the last part of the lecture, which is actually very, very important, uh, is about training in difficult airway. And we're not talking about just teaching people how to intubate or put a trachea, tracheal tube. As it's about everything else, and which Dheeraj is going to take us through. Um, Dheeraj, over to you on uh, uh, training in difficult airway. Yes, Sadhiraj, your screen is there and you. Uh, I'm audible also, I suppose. You're very audible, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Very clear. So, a uh, wonderful session throughout the day. And uh, at the end of the day, now we need to talk that we have seen what we can do in the difficult airways, anticipated, unanticipated, the human factors and everything. But all of this needs actually some sort of training to happen because without a training things will become a bit of difficult to manage a anticipated or an unanticipated difficult airway so i'll be talking about uh, difficult airway training why when and how and uh, the outline will be basically almost everything whom and who why 
why is it needed what actually needs to be a part of training when and how it needs to be trained and basically it's not like a teaching is something a new way or a new concept but there has been a traditional teaching and definitely there have been newer methods of teaching and we'll see how a best of these two things can be integrated to get the best result out of a training so another thing i wanted to emphasize was this is not basically talk only for the trainees or for uh, that matter that how do you uh, get into what are the different aspects of training but it is more essential for actually people who want to become trainers and for that matter everybody is a potential trainer so when we talk about whom and who so we need to differentiate very clearly that what our target audience is are we talking about doctors versus paramedics are we talking about anesthesiologist versus non anesthesiologist for example in emergency department in icus it will be a different there will be also a difficult airway which is happening again difficult airway though has been def defined very clearly by the society but at the same time it becomes a bit of relative thing especially for non anesthesiologist people who might not be doing that thing very uh, uh, regularly and the last thing is beginner versus expert now this is one point which i would like to very clearly uh, uh, emphasize many a times people have the misconception that the trainings are only for the novices or for the freshers but it is very important that we emphasize that this is a skill and over a period of time a medical skill for that matter whatever it be it is very clear that the skills will decay and even if you are supposed to be an expert for whatever virtue at over a period of time you need to continue to nurture that skills you need to have the refresher training very much somebody who is a subject today or somebody who is uh, doing uh, undergoing a trainee will actually become a trainer tomorrow so that is something it's very relative who and a whom thing now next comes the why this is probably one of the most easiest thing or easiest uh, thing why everybody knows why for anesthesiologist uh, this is one of the most uh, what do you call a revered thing a thing which they carry with a pride the day in and day out we are doing intubations handling the airways putting the lms and what not and imagine one fine day that you are not able to do it it happens it will happen because in anticipated or unanticipated and that is something which is going to cost the patient is uh, a life if not taken care properly and also at the same time this is something which will not be good for your own self esteem in a long period of time and that is why it is very important for an anesthesiologist for that matter any airway provider to have this trainings done very regularly so this is very clear and most of us will agree that it is uh, there is no question about it now if you look at the major complications of the airway management uk project we all know this it almost a significant amount of airway which were mismanaged resulted either in death or in the brain damage and that is a huge number isn't it and second thing is when we talk about uh, airway as we have been emphasizing throughout the various sessions it's not only about putting a tube or anything especially if you look at the other side the airway problems can be multiple intubation related problems aspiration of gastric contents and failed intubation almost everything is a problem so we need to look the whole picture in total rather than looking at only one aspect of training and everything another thing is we all know that a definition of a difficult airway is something uh, anticipated or an anticipated difficulty which is uh, experienced by a physician who is trained into anesthesia care but this is also again relative we look into the anesthesiology guidelines we had guidelines in 2003 2013 2022 a person who have been trained in 2003 for example and if he is not updated over a period of time he not be he may not be a current expert so that is one more thing the science continues to evolve the literature continues to evolve and for us to maintain that status that i am an expert uh, person to provide an airway we in ourselves need to be very much uh, be updated with the latest guideline that is one more reason why you should have a difficult airway training gadgets are improving as we had been discussing throughout for example shiv sir was talking about his residency days and then what has happened change over a period of time there have been multiple gadgets in the market and everything and all of them have their own purposes isn't it for us it is becomes very important that we are masters in at least one of these categories i mean one instrument in at least all of these categories so that during our plan a b c d we are uh, able to uh, use these gadgets and for this thing it will not happen overnight isn't it it will have to have a rigorous amount of training something which was not there 
there during your residency you will have to learn it now and something which is currently for the newer generation things might have gotten little bit obsolete as madam was talking about that the current generation is more looking into video laryngoscopy and they might need to be more familiarized with the direct laryngoscopy so yes we need to be very much clear upon this thing third thing expertise is relative this is something i have been talking about what was yesterday have been obsolete uh, today and if somebody was an expert in a particular technique he might not necessarily be an expert in an another technique for example i might be very good in a laryngoscopy but what happens if i'm not a good able to have never done a training or never seen anything about front of neck access so i am a complete airway provider no so expertise is relative and when we talk about expertise we should be saying from all angles that at the end of the day i am able to provide a patent and a protected airway a patent airway and a protected airway that is what my uh, job should be Yes, there have been various places, especially in the Western countries, where mandatory trainings are required for continuation of your accreditation of your degrees and everything. That becomes one more reason that why you need to have a training. Of course, it has medical legal implications. We all know our certifications or a proper training that you have undergone this training again and everything, a log books which you have completed for training purposes will definitely help you in cases of medical legal implications. This is one more uh, reason. then as we were talking just now about artificial intelligence and update in medical education technology things have significantly evolved over a period of time for traditional classroom teachings to skill lab and simulation based training things have come a long way and ultimately it has to be a perfect balance or a combination of both of these things how we can utilize we'll see that over a period of time in our lecture then we should take this as a uh, matter of pride that we are anesthesiologists can become training leaders in airway breathing and circulation we all know currently the government of india has undertaken a national emergency life support project and anesthesiologists are one of the leading members for this projects and again the reason because we are masters in a particular course and why not take our that role of uh, having a master is expertise to a next level by imparting that training and education to the other people who require it very much and at the end of the day we are here for patient our ultimate aim is that we need to improve the quality of care we give to patient and we need to do the patient safety as our highest priority irrespective of anything and one of the reasons or one of the things what we talk about is airway kills before breathing breathing kills before circulation in any emergency so a management of airway and the training of how to manage the difficult airway becomes a prime important thing now the question comes when we we know why of it now the thing is actually what are we looking into the training for difficult airway now this is a very uh, uh, nice uh, concept this is a uh, kirkpatrick's model of evaluation of training so if i am designing a training program i have to ask basically four different questions at what level i am going to change my thing now this might seem a bit uh, uh, i don't know what to, a word to use for this thing that people might think that this is basically a job only for medical colleges and institute of uh, learning to do the impart uh, to impart the training no a training can be done even in low resource setups or a high resource setup and this is something which all of us should take pride into now the first basic thing is did the participants value the training this is the basic questions when we design any training now the next question will be learning of the participant did participants change the attitudes or perception and did it resulted in improvement of knowledge or skills in a test setting so these are two basic things which we look if we are designing even an advanced program or something like even uh, more advanced courses then the ultimate question comes did participant improve their performance in clinical practice and lastly we are doing this for patient did the patient benefit from the training to get a clear cut result in uh, group 3 and group 4 is slightly difficult even uh, at least for resource limited setup but at least this base level 1 and level 2 is something we should be looking when we are designing a particular program that my participants need to value this training and at the end of this training at least there should be some improvement in their knowledge skill and attitude that is what i am looking into now when we talk about okay we have decided to do a training but what am i going to do a training so for any training for that matter there are four or five components which are very important i should be able to update them about equipment i should be able to update them about human resources i should be able to update them about the latest protocols i should be able to update them about what is the infrastructure required for all these things and of course the soft skills which we talked about that is the teamwork and other reasons isn't it so as we say the skills decay 
and there are routinely practice skills versus rarely practice skills so even for example cricothyrotomy fiber optic bronchoscopy it might not be practiced that frequently by almost everyone so we need to be very clear what we are looking to newer gadgets and unfamiliarity we have already talked about human resources again basic versus advanced ot versus non ot setup to train my team to train my uh, paramedical worker to train my nurse i need to be very clear that what am i going to train them so i have to be very clear about what my target audience is then whether they are trainee or whether they are experienced if i don't plan it accordingly both the things they might not value what i'm teaching them and that becomes the very basis the kit patrick part 1 that might Uh, participant should value for a trainee if i talk too much advanced thing he might say this is not something useful for me and for a experienced learner if i say let's learn basic ambu bag it might not be valuable for them so always decide what your target population is and who your supporting staff is protocols very important we need to be very clear that what we are teaching them and here i would like to emphasize that routine training like daily bedside training classroom department based discussion self directed learning all becomes very important and not only in the um, uh, medical institutes but even at your own uh, clinics nursing homes this is something which can be done for example daily bedside teaching this is something which we do very commonly at our first years uh, post graduates they come we are doing them a bag and mask ventilation and if they are not able to do or we ask them that if you are not able to do a bag again mask ventilation what will you do so all of them will start answering i'll do an intubation i'll put an oral way i'll put an everything so then we try to correct them you do whatever you want to do but the first thing you do is while you are doing attempting this the first thing you need to do is call for help so this is how you start emphasizing the algorithms not only in the simulation one or two daily lectures but at a daily things that we are doing and this is a very great opportunity because this is the maximum time when we are spending time with our trainees or with our colleagues then self directed learning thanks to covid 19 and everything there are a lot of webinars and things happening for example we have have a recorded reading here you can people can always go back and look into that what is happening and what not and then of course what are the newer guidelines which are happening for example we have a difficult airway society guidelines aida guidelines asa guidelines so decide okay i'll be following this particular guideline but at the same time my all the staff should be participating into those same guidelines so this is something you can decide upon a particular lecture you can break these guidelines into today for the example this month i'll be talking only about plan a next month i'll be doing plan b plan c this is something you will have to do indigenous there are standardized courses where people can go and do but at the same time when we are designing your own courses try and break make it uh, simple and break it up into pieces checklist becomes very important people will value those algorithms guidelines guidelines are there to help you for example if i am in a difficulty people have already thought about and decided that if particular thing happens this is what needs to do so a expert group has already decided and made it simple for you that this is what needs to be done but most of the guidelines will have basically a checklist so we need to make our team very much familiar with deciding about checklist one of the novel ways what we found when we do in our training for our post graduate students we ask them to make a oski station and we ask them to make the checklist for an oski station for example if i am doing an ambu bag training i don't do a training i ask the participants to judge each other and i ask them what are the points you would be looking into when you are doing a judge judgement for example participant a and participant b is there and i'll ask them both of you do an ambu bag and each of you judge each other so then they will start looking first did he wash his hands or not for example just i'm giving did he do the proper c and e technique or not did he selected a correct mask size or not then did he do a proper head tilt chin lift or not or jaw thrust whatever the indication was did he see whether the whatever intervention he was being was effective or not that's a simple checklist isn't it and this is something you don't need a very high fidelity or a medical college to do this is something everybody can do as a part of training then you have of course standardized courses and they are very much valuable so once you have a basic training or something you can try and send your team for the standardized courses wherever possible in india also you'll have different courses based on resources and requirement lastly it's very important to talk about infrastructure i have everything but if i don't have the infrastructure requirement for training people will talk about simulation lab appropriate training gadget mannequins i'll come to that in a short while and this is something there's a probably a big mental hurdle that a small center cannot do a 
proper training because it requires a very costlier gadgets and everything and that is a misconception we need to do away with it's easy to do trainings even in small setup and with almost same results as much as you would do in a bigger lab isn't it so that brings to high fidelity versus low fidelity skill lab infrastructure and we'll talk about that this is something which i already dr umar uh, uh, talked about and if you look at into here the education and training and the judgment these are all team factors the soft skill human factors and this is something which can be done only when you are doing a training in a simulation or a closed scenario this is not something you will be able to learn only by reading a book or something or a guideline you will actually need to practice in this in some setting then we talk about only adult population but there are special populations we will have to design the training so decide what you are doing uh, we have done a normal adult training now this time i want to focus on pediatric training i do a lot of pediatric cases i want to focus on pediatric i do a lot of cesarean sections obese patients high risk pregnancy cases my staff need to be well trained into pregnancy managing a difficult airway take your staff to those things and train them what is required everything will have its own challenges but it will have a uh, fruitful result at the end of the day now having looked into why having i am mean, looked into uh, what aspect of it then last comes the question where when and how so it is something very important don't be uh, carried away by high fancy skill labs or something they are important that is definitely there but that doesn't mean that's the end of the world and this is like a uh, training cannot be done in a routine scenario this is very important so the question comes training and when and how so training and refresher training are very important we are fortunately don't have that much of a requirement currently in indian scenario uh, based on a particular thing we say that we need to have a particular cme point but those are not specific that it should be from airway or for certain thing but yes refresher training are very important fortunately i would say that most of the anesthesiologists they believe that we will be able to train on our own or uh, and they don't need a medical legal so that's a great incentive where people believe that i need to get myself trained again and again in a periodic period of time routine classroom teaching we have talked about special courses we have talked about now let's come and talk about simulation based airway training so when we talk about simulation based airway training there is absolutely good amount of evidence uh, to show that not only for airway but for almost most of the skills which are especially life or limb threatening management skills simulation plays a great role now whether it plays a great role in cut press classification one or two or more uh, uh, into class 3 class 4 this is something the literature is still looking into but there is uh, without a doubt uh, 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 agreement that it will improve your knowledge skills and attitude when you are doing a simulation based team training it will increase the learner satisfaction knowledge technical skills ultimately the patient outcomes but the problem is people get stuck into the mindset that we need to have a high fidelity uh, skill lab high fidelity means a costlier equipments a costlier mannequins and a very high fi mannequins and fortunately or unfortunately whatever said and done the people the marketing agency they also tend to sell them more as compared to low fidelity it has been shown significantly that the uh, using high versus low fidelity simulator mannequins for airway or for that matter in any other thing they are almost equal at least for the most of the skills so yes high fidelity will work for sometimes but 90% of the time even a basic mannequin or something like a low fidelity simulation even on simulated patients or something without doing an invasive process or something will achieve almost as good as result <laughs> you might be surprised to see that at, there are some articles even contradicting for example this article from bmc education says high fidelity is not superior to low fidelity simulation but at time might lead to over confidence in medical students so yeah there are conflicting reports and at the end of the day there is a significant uh, data supporting that routine small uh, cost effective centers can be easily made skill lab centers can be made there are newer technologies 3d printing and everything i will not go into those details but over a period of time this artificial intelligence and everything this will make our life much easier and probably much much cost effective now the last part of this is how to teach i mean like this is uh, uh, people might feel like oh, you can't ask us how to teach but over a period of time as you might be seeing 
that uh, medical teaching is basically the question is it's an art or science people say there are naturally born teachers and then there are certain others who just try to be there but at the end of the day we should see teaching as an art and science it's a combination of both the things and one should improve over a period of time national medical Com commission has now made it mandatory for all the medical teachers to undergo uh, definitive training in medical education technology and this is not very difficult even in conferences and everything people from non-medical institutes can undergo these courses and this can be made very uh, user-friendly courses even how to do a medical teaching isn't it there is a separate society for education in anesthesia there's a separate journal pubmed journal for journal of education in perioperative medicine what i'm trying to emphasize here is we talk about all the guidelines we talk about all the fancy things about how to do an intubation and everything but at the same time we conventionally probably unintentionally forget that training your own staff becomes a very important thing and it's high time that we come and take that role not only of clinician but also for teaching our own team or our own unit this is a very common proverb we all know i hear i forget i see i remember i do i understand i'm not going to this is very uh, to talk about how to do a medical education technology training, how to do a simulation based training. It's altogether a separate talk, but I'll just try to see if I can touch upon the basic aspects like what are we trying to do when we are trying to say that I want to do. For example, a nursing home, everybody has basic airway gadgets. You have all the team you need uh, to this thing. The clinician or the anesthetist there, he's well versed with the guidelines and everything. People are ready to pay a little bit. The hospitals are pay, ready to pay a little bit for getting the trainings and everything. So you have done, you have sorted out all the questions. Now the question comes, how do I train them? Then th th that is a problem where people start to make their own judgment and decide and oh, probably this is not my cup of tea, but this is something you'll have to start from a baby steps over a period of time. There are certain teaching taxonomies. I'm not going to talk about medical education in detail, but basic thing what we need to know is there is something called as knowledge, skills and attitude. And that is the most important thing. When we talk about any particular procedure or anything, I'll try to fix all of this into by giving an example. This is what we call as the triad of medical, medical education. That is, there is a knowledge, there is skills and there is attitude for this knowledge and skills club together. Now, this is one of the most important thing. This is probably another reason that why people should start taking interest or taking lead in training. For example, if you, this is something like uh, this has been adapted from the NTL Institute of Applied Behavioral Science. When you are teaching a particular talk or whatever particular topic is taken, for example, fiber optic bronchoscopy I'm taking. So if you do a lecture, you might be remembering only 5%. If you do some sort of reading, you might be doing 10%. If you see some videos, if you see some discussion, the retention might go up. But when you actually practice doing that particular skill, your retention goes very much. But look at the last thing of here. When you actually teach others, the retention is even more significant. So this is what we call auditory, visual, and kinesthetic skills. And the best part of this is when you are teaching other or when you are practicing a particular thing, the chances of you retaining that skill is probably the highest. And this is why we should take an initiative to teach others because it's a sort of uh, your own selfishness that by teaching others, you will be able to retain more and more. Now let's take an another example. This is Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah, you can see all there are may, many fancy words, but a lot of importance, but I'm not going to uh, go into. The basic thing is that we need to remember, then we need to understand, then we actually apply. And then there are certain words like analyze, evaluate, and create, isn't it? But that means that uh, when you look into an example, this is an another way of looking the same thing. Your basic is knowledge, comprehension, and application. So this is where your undergraduate and trainee lies in. But when you want to become an expert person, you actually have to go to the higher step of teaching, that is analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Now, me as a clinician, I don't want to get stuck over my trainee part of it. I want to become an expert in a particular thing. And how do I become an expert? in particular thing one of the thing is when i start critically analyzing a particular thing when i try to um, teach someone the other thing that is how i will uh, progress on my own isn't it and this is one basic thing which probably all of us should be remembering if i am teaching someone this is how i should look into knows knows how shows how does i'll give you a very uh, clear example for example if you are talking about a fiber optic bronchoscopy the basic thing is that the person should know the steps of bronchoscopy 
isn't it? Then he might should be able to tell that why these steps are important. For example, he says, I have to give topical airway anesthesia. Then I have to give, uh, 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 I have to prepare my equipment. Then I have to part, put my fiber optic bronchoscope through nasal uh, cannula and then go. Then if he says, Ki, I, uh, topical anesthesia is important because my airway has to be anesthetized so that it doesn't give me a problem. Then this becomes your basic thing that he has a knowledge and competence. Then he should show this knowledge into a skill part of it that he should be able to show you that how it is being done. And what does mean this does bad? That what is the difference between shows how and does? Shows how he keeps on talking. That is, whenever he's doing a step, he keeps on talking those particular steps. That is, verbalizing the step. But at the last of the time, he performs the things independently, even without having to tell all these things. So if you are evaluating your particular candidate, this is how would you would evaluate a particular candidate. Maybe your first year can say knows or knows how. Your second year can say shows how. And your final year trainee can do a particular thing. For any skill, ambu bag. Your new person can say knows or knows how, but by the time you are uh, even your nurse or anything, she should be able to do this thing very clearly and frequently. So this is how you should evaluate and conduct the course. So I hear, I forget. For example, there is a class. I might not be able to retain a significant amount. It. I see a particular video. I might be able to remember. But if I do that particular thing, I'll understand there will be small steps which I'll be missing. I'll be discussing it and ultimately you'll be able to remember. So these are the three different stages, simple stages of how you can conduct a training at your own place. Have your simple lectures, have your video demonstrations, then ask your participant to do a, this uh, practice and at the end have an evaluation form. There can be learning resources. Whenever you are doing a course, very important that you give some short reference books to your participants so they'd come prepared for the class. Have some small basic PPTs and lectures. Don't try to make too many of theory things. Make it more of a skill-based training, especially with uh, today's blended lect lecture or flipped classroom teaching, where you give the knowledge part or the books to them. They read it. You come them, you explain to them the basic thing, and then you straight away go to the skills part where they actually are able to perform this particular procedures. Now, this is what we are talking about. Let's take a fiber optic example. A lecture PPT on fiber optic, your retention might be 5%. If you are reading, you will be able to provide a module on fiber optic, some notes on fiber optic. There might be a video demonstration, your retention rate will go up. If you are doing a demonstration, you showed a video and now you are demonstrating it actually in a mannequin or skill lab, the retention rate will go up. Then you start discussing this in the group session and then you ask your participant what happened, what not happened, the retention will be even more higher because now it becomes interactive. Then you ask them to practice it on mannequin or in the real life, your retention rate will be very high. And then these are the routine things. But when you start actually teaching fiber optic to someone else, your juniors and colleagues, your retention rate, your expertise will actually go up very significantly. So a simple thing explained, uh, a simple uh, art of teaching others is at the end of the day going to be helpful for you. Same for knowledge. He should be able to do preparation for skills. We should know that how he is going to perform that thing. And for attitude part, the team dynamics, which Dr. Uma Madam had talked about, these all things you can combinedly see in a skill lab. For example, if you are talking about Ambu bag, he should be able to tell you from knowledge, what are the indications, what are the contraindications, then skills he should be able to show you. And in the attitude, you ask two or three persons to be a part of the team, and then he'll be able to talk to the team that I need this particular thing. And that way the Ambu bag whole teaching has to be complete rather than saying, just show me a C and E technique, isn't it? I'll not go into this detail. This is something which we talk about higher part. For example, if a person routinely did all the basic thing, but then if you start analyzing, for example, he starts to analyze the difference between normal adult and a full-term pregnant patient airway management differences, you can say that, okay, he's progressing from a basic trainee to a higher person, isn't it? Your team has started progressing. Evaluation, that is even more higher. Probably he's able to appraise, argue, defend, or critique the decisions made in algorithm on a right way. You had a whole scenario, after that scenario, there has been debriefing, and then he's able to start arguing, arguing in the sense, a positive constructive arguing that why he did a particular step, that becomes important. And this is the highest steps in the learning, like a thinking a profession. When that person decides, okay, how can I apply this? For example, can I prepare a difficult airway card in my small nursing home? This is a good thing because he has applied that knowledge to create something new. How can he do a training idea at a first referral unit or something like that? So 
basically the idea is that whoever your team members are bring them from this stage and try to see how much they can progress but at least the basic three components every month for your team should be able to do we all remember this movie from tom hanks why i put it here is because uh, at the end of the day simulation lab or something it will be able to create most of the scenarios which happens in ot and this uh, your emergency department or anything but actually there will be certain human factors or something which cannot happen so it is not to say that skill lab is the ultimate answer to everything so you'll have to look into the other factors your routine teaching versus and the skill lab training both of them have to go hand in hand you have to have feedback from training no training is complete without having a feedback have the log books completed have the documentation of procedures have some subjective and objective assessment at the end of the day for example he is able to complete this thing he is able to do 10 mcqs and then a faculty interaction at the end of the day becomes very important so to have a take home message training in low resources is very much feasible train your teams train your nearby facilities low fidelity simulation that is simulation without very costly mannequins or something works almost as good as high fidelity in most of our day to day important scenarios so this is, should not become a major hindrance for us to say that okay this will not work for uh, uh, my uh, center i will not be able to do because i don't have costlier mannequins training is important but retraining also should be that much important you have trained you are say paramedic and for next 2 to 3 years he has been practicing some other skills or some new up, uh, update has been there so refresher training should be there how do you do a training plan the most important is talk about your target audience who your target audience are and your learning objectives should be according to the target audience don't keep very high fi that for example in one day i will be training my first year post graduate to do a fiber optic intuition keep the learning objectives something achievable so try to uh, what you call collect the low hanging fruits at the start of the training your team will be motivated if you do a very high fi training at the start your team will be demotivated you yourself as a team leader will be demotivated so start from simple then the most important part is preparation preparation of a training if you have a skill lab very good otherwise you need to decide what basic equipments i need and what is the venue arrangement i'll need trainers should be all working towards the same goal if somebody is decided that today i'll be talking about fiber optic i say supraglottic devices stick to supraglottic devices somebody gets from the plan and they say okay i'll talk about trichothyrotomy in between then it becomes a problem so the team leader or a team nodal person should see that all the trainers are working towards the same for example sir takes a team leader role here that he decides that okay this is what i want to do in today's scenario and everybody sticks to the same plan it has to be time bound i hope i am also time bound for my current talk but then if you exceed the time on anything it becomes boring don't do anything which will have a repercussion effect stick to your learning objectives no training is complete without an assessment that is as simple as that assessment is altogether a different topic we'll not go into that maybe at some point of time we'll have a different talk on how to do a simulation based learning how to do a subjective and objective assessment but have some sort of objective or subjective assessment at least say my training did good bad worse he needs some remediation i put some 10 basic mcqs and say he attempted at least seven of it correctly so have some sort of feedback and at the end of the training have your feedback that is 3d you analyze the data analyze the data in the sense how much of your students passed in this particular training whether all of your trainers stick to the plan or not so these are all data you collect from the training discuss amongst your team oh see this is what we had planned but people started talking all different things this should not happen and then improvise and design plan for the next training so this is how you learn the first might be always a failure but you need to we all need to take baby steps in that right direction to plan for a proper training lastly i would say train not to teach but to learn once you start realizing that you have your own selfish goal into this that when i am teaching others i'll be able to learn that is the best thing can happen and people will automatically start doing start training from your uh, own small setup start training the paramedics the nurses and everything and you will feel that there is a immense amount of pleasure in that training part of it and at the end of the day you will have great results to see in actually patient outcomes thank you thank you dheeraj for a wonderful uh, lecture i think yeah. sir i am not able to actually switch off the stop screen. sharing not able to see the screen
on the top that cursor has gone just a minute sir is it possible <laughs> that you will be able to do it sir uh, don't think host? so oh, okay okay i got it yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so i think it's a wonderful lecture um uh, it's going from somewhere somewhere Yeah, I think uh, can people mute themselves and be, I think uh, only, uh, can everybody mute yourself? And then when you want to talk, I will, I'll ask you to actually unmute. Uh, I think uh, well, very uh, excellent, excellent lecture. And uh, uh, I think it covered all aspects of the teaching. Uh, teaching methods of teaching are, very different. Everybody has their own own methods, but I think there are certain things which are uh, very, very important. And I always say that you start with a why. Why do you want to teach uh, or which group you want to teach? And then that is knowing your audience, isn't it? But unfortunately, like for example, for us, sometimes we don't actually know our audience at all. And we have a full range of uh, audience where we have people who are just trainees to uh, professor level. So sometimes we are not able to do that in a bigger organization like ours. But we know that there is a need for something so that we know our why. And uh, once we know our why, uh, then we decide, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to uh, just take lectures? Are we going to have face-to-face? -face? Are we going to have workshops? And then ultimately, how are we going to do it? And then I think you uh, rightly said that uh, your target, uh, your uh, thing should be SMART. Objective should be SMART. Uh, SMART is acronym for being very specific. It should be measurable. It should be achievable. It should be uh, like, uh, what is it called? Realistic. And it should be timely, right? Now, if I don't do it regularly on time, I'll say, okay, but two years later, yeah. And it's not going to be. If the need is now, then you need to actually start thinking how we're going to do it. And then you really say we are actually now discussing theory, we are actually talking, we are discussing. But in the end, what people will actually get the most is what we're going to do in a fortnight time in Mumbai, the face-to-face, -face, where people will actually be part of the workshop. They will be observing us doing you know live videos, able to do a two-way interaction. Uh, and then on the workshops, we'll have face-to-face -face interaction, um, be able to you know, use a fiber optic, hold a fiber optic. There are people who have never held a fiber optic in their hand. A leave alone fiber optic, there are people who haven't held a second generation supraglottic device in their hand. So they will actually get that opportunity to see it. And that will give them the confidence to go back and do it. I think that's where it lies. And as far as faculty is concerned, I've always said that you learn as you teach, I think you are a student, always a student. You have to go back and that is your reach the ultimate level or, or you're on the top of the pyramid. And we have already done it. I think we have had from the time we started the group and uh, there have been faculty who have actually been with us, become experts, left us. That's fine, it's okay. We probably achieved our goal. Uh, some of them are still with us. That's, that's uh, thank you to them. They continue to be uh, part of the group. But that's how life works. You know, your, your own children don't stay with you all the time. <laughs> so people will. But that is a great achievement that they, someone who couldn't actually, you know, even talk properly uh, with you and went and as becoming a, you know, speaking on a, a national uh, level. Now that's a great achievement for us. Uh, whether they are with us or not, it's, it's immaterial. So, you know, being able to uh, teach on a platform, learning, mentoring, these are very, very important part of it. And if you can then, you know, percolate that down to others, you know, it doesn't matter, like I said, even in the theaters, if it's an orderly, it's a eye, it is a mousey, whatever you call it, and things, train them, empower them. Uh, everybody, you can teach everybody. Everybody has got, like I said, you need to, know their positives. They need to know your, their strengths and weaknesses. And everybody has got something very special, this much I'll tell you. It doesn't matter who you are or what level you are. There is something, always something special. And if you actually observe them, you will notice that. And that's what you need to 
you know, nurture in them and, and use that to their advantage. Otherwise, it's just going there. Their, that talent is going waste or their uh, thing is going waste. I think this is a, a very a nice lecture. I think uh, covered a uh, lots of aspects of uh, teaching and training. And I'm sure we have also picked up a few things. All of us have picked up a few things from uh, that and which we can uh, use in our own day-to-day -day teaching and that. And I think that point of actually that high fidelity versus low fidelity and uh, you know high cost to the, that is absolutely true. So very true that you can actually use low fidelity uh, things and still be able to train people. It doesn't have to be hi-fi centers or hi-fi uh, you know, equipment. You can train from very basic and be innovative. Be innovative. Uh, uh, there are actually some of the videos where we have actually created our own trachea. So the, you know, the breathing tubes, they come with the corrugated tubes, they, uh, you know, put a, uh, you know, layer of uh, foam on it, and you can actually have a feel as if they're a cathartomy. Then you can train them uh, to do a, uh, you know, phone up, front of neck axis. And um, there are, we are, I once even went to a butcher and said, can I actually have a few tracheas? Uh, uh, we put the tracheas into foam lane and, you know, uh, yeah, and then created our own thing uh, for uh, front of the neck. So you can do that. There is, different ways of uh, being innovative and uh, trying to you know teach in a different way and it makes us interesting as well when you are using your own thing with the available to uh, creating your own technique and i think the other thing is the 3d printing i think that is go is, is a massive thing you can actually now uh, print anything if you have an idea you know how to do it you can create your own uh, you know mannequins and <laughs> front of neck and whatnot Costly, but I think with future, I think it will become cheaper. Uh, anyone else who need uh, would like to add something to this uh, discussion? I have, yes. Uh, hello. Yeah, I think uh, Dheeraj, wonderful lecture. Thank you so much uh, for uh, yeah refreshing us with everything. Um, writing a reflection after attending any course is, I think, uh, something which I learned after I came here and it should be probably integrated in, uh, uh, you know, apart from doing a subjective and objective assessment. We do always reflect after uh, every day's list that I, what I could have done better. But, you know, if you get those points down, they can be uh, a useful uh, learning aid as well. Thank you. Very yeah, cool. Little, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mega, you, you say then we can. We can I, I, on a lighter uh, note, I mean, Dr. Dheeraj, excellent, wonderful lecture. And uh, yeah, I'm inspired to teach more uh, in my limited uh, scope. Yeah. Uh, the funny question that must have Dr. Mega, there is food after this lecture? I was like, yeah, there will be food after this lecture. But yes. So, you know, sometimes you have to bribe them to come to, not to bribe <laughs> is not the word, but yeah, make some incentives for attending the lecture. Incentives. They're happy. You know. uh, Recently, we tried. Uh, yeah, and sometimes you have to actually, like you say, even in a family where there the are children and things like that, and, uh, you know, trying to get things done, you have to use different methods. No, I, not everybody is, uh, you know, some people require a little push, some people require a little bit of encouragement, others are over-enthusiastic. You know, there'll be always a one student in the class will always raise the hand for everything. And there are others, they have good knowledge, but they will just actually sit and smile at the back. So you always have those, those find me there and the others are there yaar okay mere ko khana milega to main aaunga sununga <laughs> ya mere ko chocolate milegi laddu milega i'll come and say so those things are there and we have to use all those methods that again again is uh, getting the attention of the uh, students not and then again the learning at different levels i think the greatest advantage of the method we use is that you can learn at your own pace and that is one thing i talk about in learning in social media uh, call it smiles uh, where you can learn at your own pace. That is the greatest advantage. Unlike in a in a classroom, right? You have a teacher, you go for a session, and if you're slow in picking up things, you lose out. Okay. So, but here you can always go back. So people who can't attend today or who are actually slow, they can always go back again and again and listen and find out what is there. So the pace 
of learning is also very very important and that what social media actually allows us to do i think as dr mega madam has rightly pointed out this ancillary thing becomes very important for any training course as it is said khali pet bhajan nahi hote something the same <laughs> way it is very important and uh, just to stress probably like uh, we have high fidelity and low fidelity even in entertainment for doing a thing we have a high fidelity entertainment and a low fidelity entertainment cost effective for example karaoke and everything which has come now into so much of picture we have started using very much in our routine day to day training like after two to three lectures we ask one of the participant to do karaoke we have a dinner and the dinner is something we attended by having some karaoke or food night where people start more interacting so this makes it probably more attractive and at the end of the day Uh, the uh, what do you call a target is achieved that the people should be attentive throughout the course just just uh, as sir said one needs to be innovative at the end of the day yeah yeah <clears throat> i think that uh, human interaction i think it's good that we are on a zoom and things like that. i'm sure if we were face to face and this interaction would have been totally different yeah but what advantage we have here is that we have more time you know we are not limited by ki that we have to finish at such a time so if there is certain delay you talked about we talk about timely delivery of thing but then you know time we can stretch a little bit on on the when you teaching on social media which we are not able to do when it is face to face yeah yeah dr pramod yeah uh, no doubt wonderful lecture by uh, dheeraj there is no question after teaching uh, for last 35 odd years i was teaching anesthesia today i learned that there is lot to learn on how to teach yeah there is lot to learn on how to teach so i think we also should not that wow, whatever senior however senior you are what is this thing but these new things are coming and we have to train ourselves also to learn to how to teach and how to train the people Yeah, thank you very much, Dheeraj. Very good, wonderful. And um, uh, just to say that we have just uh, achieved, we have crossed the thousand uh, views on the. Uh, wonderful. The That's good. Uh, it's because I'm con- constantly monitoring the <laughs> what's happening. It's part of the studio thing. Uh, yeah. So I have actually sent uh, out uh, the uh, you know link to Zoom for everyone, and uh, uh, I've invited them. Uh, they can interact. interact with us so uh, our delegates are most welcome to join us uh, to interact as uh, see we got uh, arun arun um, do you want to share about your your um, workshop you are going to organize in uh, telangana in hyderabad arunendra I think so anyway, I think I will. I will. Hmm. I think he may have stepped out for a moment just now. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was he was uh, working today, so I think he messaged me and uh, thing. So we have got the uh, uh, following the uh, week on uh, from uh, Mumbai rats. So we have also got ultrasound. So in uh, Mumbai, it is all uh, landmark and uh, PNS guided workshop, uh, but uh, from. Uh, in hyderabad we have got uh, the ultrasound workshop uh, arun indra is back arun yeah over to you arun you got a hand up man unmute yourself hello yes arun yeah arun. yeah uh, thank you very much sir uh, for this uh, opportunity it was a wonderful and uh, enlightening lecture by dr dheeraj i could recollect some of the experiences i had uh, at tacon uh, which uh, we had done in november on that note i would like to uh, welcome uh, all the delegates and uh, uh, participants to through isa hyderabad and uh, plexus anesthesia critical care for an event uh, by our own uh, gas faculty with dr shiv kumar singh sir Uh, heading the faculty uh, the event will be a two day event it will be in um, held on march 25th and 26th in hyderabad i'm just yeah. sharing the photos sir yeah we can you can share yeah 
sir can you yes we can see it yes so the event is going to be a live uh, event from the uh, one of the super specialty hospitals of hyderabad that is esic hospital uh, where there's a lot of uh, abundance of uh, cases it will be a one day uh, program uh, for the live session followed by the cme in the evening and the second day will be a complete workshop uh, with uh, our uh, very highly talented faculty uh, which have uh, displayed so i request uh, all of you to take uh, this opportunity and register by visiting uh, www.tune2023.co.in thank you sir Yeah, so we will have also have hands on. The second day is actually going to be hands on on twenty sixth of uh, March. It is going to be hands on, and uh, this is going to be the live workshop from ESI. We did the NBFM uh, just before COVID from the hospital. Uh, Doctor Gopinath is a very senior consultant, a very knowledgeable consultant, and he's been uh, uh, you know uh, very helpful uh, in organizing these workshops. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be great to actually see everybody in uh, Hyderabad. And unfortunately, this is limited to only 100 people because of the hands-on. Uh, but for the live workshop, uh, as many people as can uh, the thing register uh, for this. Uh, we have divided the registration this. also for two days, sir. Those who are attending the ultrasound guided workshop, there are 100 registrations. And the live uh, session, uh, there is a separate registration which will be half of the total registration amount. Yeah. Okay, you can uh, stop. Yeah. Thank sharing. you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so there are a few people who have actually joined from the uh, delegates. Uh, if anybody wants to share anything or want to say anything, uh, they're most welcome. Uh, we have uh, DSP, we have Dilnas, Rabindra Shah, and Shilpa is one of our own faculty. Dilnas has her hands up today. Hello, Dilnas, yes. Hi, sir. Thank Hello. you. It was a very well Sunday spent. So very nice that I could join into this registership with the help of Prasanna. Mm. And uh, I have learned too many things in these two days. I would only like to tell you that in the door workshop, I would like to go in myself uh, for a cricothyrotomy because I have seen them, but I have not been able to do ha or had an opportunity to undergo that any time before because our hospital is not having that many cases for us to have any difficult intubations to undergo for a cricothyrotomy. So I would like to be a part of that, sir. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There will be a station uh, for that. Uh, we're trying to actually design. Like I said, it is difficult to always get uh, good mannequins, but I think it's more important is to understand the basics of it. And here and, we are not uh, having ultrasound. I'm using more of ultrasound for most of the cases. Even for difficult intubations, we have a video laryngoscope Mac. Even for uh, a, a difficult uh, IJV, I undergo with the ultrasound and do yeah. it. But yeah. this is my difficult, unanticipated intubation, which may be, I don't wish to go into the plan D, definitely. But I would definitely like to be myself conversant with that. Yes, yes. We will likely have a station for that because the whole workshop has been designed uh, for that. So it is, whether it is you're in a, a limited uh, resource center or you're in an advanced center, ultimately the when you lose everything and you you have to know how to uh, do a front of neck. Okay. And yeah. you need to have, so our all trolleys, it's a very simple kit. You need is a bougie, you yeah. need is a scalpel and you need a size uh, six tube. Um, that's. Uh, available to everyone the theater should actually have that and all you need to keep that but, for that but uh, on a patient who is going there i should be confident to do that you sir. have got no other option so you sad, even if the equipment is there 
so that is that is one one thing that uh, you have to actually understand that when when you are in that situation either you can have a dead patient or you can actually just it doesn't matter if there is blood or thing you get a tube in oxygenate the patient the oxygen uh, the oxygen you going to provide through the neck is the one which is going to save you right sir yeah Thank so you, you need to actually get that that confidence say that if i don't do this patient is going to die right doesn't sir it? yeah yeah so you can actually have a very good neck and and a dead patient that's fine but that's not what the aim is aim is just go for it and have that courage to say that i can just do a stab put in a buji and put in a tube and that's why it has been made as a as a standardized uh, thing because previously there was okay you can put a 16 g cannula you can put this you can put that no that is completely out now it is all simple a uh, front of neck is basically your scalp your buji and your tube i have to give you one good news that i have been officially appointed as the head of the department so i want congratulations to bring, i want to bring in all the changes that were not being done in my hospital and try Fantastic. to be uh, a good sort of support to my colleagues wonderful wonderful uh, i think uh, you you are a role model for many people and i think uh, Uh, at at your age you have been so active in learning uh, and i think also this is a time i think what i have observed is i think you did actually ask me about uh, tech on that you want to be faculty but by then we had already decided the program i think this is a time when you actually step up and start teaching as well and become a faculty thank you sir thanks i hope i get an opportunity i you start you, you have to just grab it <laughs> <laughs> I, I i declare i ask ask people yeah i just have to grab it and say i want to give this lecture a uh, prasanna is here she said uh, well, she wanted to and i think it was dheeraj also says they say why doesn't prasanna do a lecture and she she took up the office they you have to like i said the once you have been you can't be well you are a student forever no doubt but then you if you want to then transfer that knowledge to others then you have to step up and become a teacher as well i and don't know what topic to pick up to ask for a faculty that's the thing <laughs> whatever interests you whatever interests you what do you do day day in day out something sometimes you think that is very basic but then from there you can actually move on kala okay. you have got it uh, yeah kala unmute unmute yourself you are still muted yeah Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Kala, we can hear you now. Hello. Yep. You muted yourself again. Unmute yourself, Kala. You unmute yourself. hello yes you can hear me now yeah 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 so just to answer uh, dilnas madam we have a good fauna station uh, we have a fauna mannequin by cooks available for uh, demonstrating and we are uh, since fine arts doesn't allow us goat or sheep trakia so we are making our own just as you said models for everyone to get a hands on so looking forward <laughs> i will i will get few bujis as well so that because you know, while practicing it does get damaged we will have actually few bujis to uh, practice on so everybody should get that and uh, size 6 tubes uh, so we can uh, practice everybody get a chance to you know uh, obviously there won't be any blood or anything we can create that as well if you want <laughs> i'm trying <laughs> but like to say, never be afraid uh, blood doesn't is not is not going to be killing the the what is going to we kill can put that? Uh, i'll try to innovate <laughs> no you don't have to don't don't make it messy it's okay not messy, it's, it's fine yeah. but uh, slimy is yes. like <laughs> okay yeah. yeah uh 
uh, Prasanna. Uh, I think uh, I think other thing which uh, Dilna did mention that you've been very helpful in getting people to uh, register, and uh, we had almost I think crossed two hundred fifty I think already. So we are at two forty nine. Uh, 249 and one one more somebody will one more yes. one more and, no, and i <laughs> i'm very sorry uh, but i could not pay much attention to all the lectures today because i was continuously getting calls and calls. messages for registration yes, yeah you so, you prasanna has been working very hard and is a single point <laughs> person for all the registration <laughs> that is coming in thick and fast uh, we have other other people as well who have actually joined us. Uh, anyone who wants to ask any question before uh, we actually end the session? Uh, Rabindra, uh, DSP. And other faculty, Sanjay, Shilpa. Um, you, can, you can talk about your experience uh, our yesterday's and today's, whatever. It doesn't have to be airway uh, thing. It's just about, uh, you know, because we were discussing about teaching, training, and other things. So you can actually talk about that if you want. Uh, so, may I? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, first, uh, I would like to congratulate you for such an excellent workshop last two days. The division of uh, lectures, the topics, and the way you have groomed and the topics have really come out so well. Like I heard a couple of lectures today afternoon and yesterday evening, which I missed, I saw the link which was sent. Yeah. It's really means uh, to depth. I think, uh, as you said, I will be going back and listening again and again. And that will be really helpful to everyone. It's not just the 250 delegates, but it will be really helpful. And uh, of course, uh, for me, uh, you have really helped me. Uh, my uh, talk has been polished, hopefully at least some percentage of what you expected and the slides and the presentation. So really, thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. I, now I know at least how I can reach to people with minimum uh, talk and you know, like maximum presentation. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah, you're most welcome. I think uh, like we, we learn and uh, the art of teaching and learning sorry, has been a constant journey for me as well. So this is something that's why when I actually are I'm doing a editing or sliding, this is over the years of experience which I'm actually putting into it. And nobody actually gave me that kind of opportunity. I had to do it myself. I had to learn over the years. And uh, here, I think if I'm able to transfer, the whole idea is to actually transfer that knowledge to everyone. And uh, you can actually see the difference in the way uh, some of the slides, I'm sure you can actually see that whose slide, because you will see a, a common pattern in, in a lot of the slides which have been edited by me. Yeah, but they look quite <laughs> yeah. professional. Yeah, they're professional in a sense that uh, when you are actually talking, you don't need too much matter on the thing. You need your keywords, you... Uh, need the less matters. That's why people should be able to listen to you. Uh, I don't want people to be actually trying to read your text on these slides. Okay, and then that means that their attention is then diverted from you to the slides, whereas they should be actually listening to you. That's where the pearls are be going to come out, isn't it? <laughs> and you don't actually have to put everything on the main slide. You can always have notes which you can. Uh, you know, go through before you present your thing. So that's that's the way of presentation. So how come you're sitting there for two whole days? It's really great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it lets say what passion, no, that's what I passion makes you do. I can't imagine. Uh, this is, that is what your passion makes you do. I think uh, I enjoyed, like I said, uh, I'm learning at the same time because what has been going on and things like you learn, uh, Everybody has uh, got their own experiences. And uh, this is about the experience. We, you, you can't get that kind of thing by, you know, uh, just reading that experience comes from people who are doing things on the ground. And that, that is very, very important uh, part of learning. Listening to those people who have done it. Sir, and can I take a leave? Hello. 
Sorry, yeah, Kala. Can I take a leave? I got an emergency. Yeah, yeah absolutely, okay? absolutely, thank absolutely. You. See you. Thank yeah, you. We will, be, yeah. we will be closing very soon anyway. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah, sure. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Uh, anybody else before we close the session? Uh, sir, I would like to uh, share I one experience uh, regarding airway management. Of course, uh, I'll just tell briefly about the patient, it, adult patient. She presented with uh, acute strider and desaturation to the emergency. It was not a case in the OT. So I was being called and uh, when I came, I saw that she was in respiratory distress and of course all those problems. But uh, we didn't have enough time to take a history and when I did a direct uh, laryngoscopy to intubate, uh, though I could see the vocal cords, uh, the tube wouldn't pass down and I could immediately sense that yes, now uh, there is an issue uh, beneath the cord, probably a subglottic stenosis. And the relatives were not very well educated to give a history that she was probably intubated for a long time previously, which mm -hmm. resulted. So the point here which I wanted to highlight was we needed a very small size endotracheal tube, uh, size of 3.5. Imagine the size of 3.5 going in an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only one which could be passed in that patient who had a subglottic stenosis. We didn't have pediatric... Um, uh, tubes in our adult resuscitation area. It was an adult adults resuscitation area because pediatric resuscitation area was separate. So uh, uh, when uh, the supporting staff saw me, you know, struggling uh, with the tube and I was, you know, uh, asking for a smaller size tube, progressively smaller tube, one uh, orderly offered himself, Ki, ma'am, can I go and get it for you? You tell me where will it be available? Mm. So I really felt uh, so nice. And uh, that person who is not even that very well educated, he is uh, seeing me struggle and understanding what I was uh, wanting to tell. That probably there is something which is not available here and maybe available at some other place in the hospital. Yeah. So I uh, told him that, yes, uh, I told my PG to write it down in a piece of paper and give it to him. He just ran to the pediatric emergency and got that 3.5 3 um, endotracheal tube and uh, along with the pediatric stillet, which he, that also I wrote it down yeah. and he just uh, went there, gave it to the sister and got it uh, for me and I could, you know, intubate with uh, uh, that tube. So I really felt very uh, good for that person and profusely thanked him and uh, unfortunately, sir, we should have some uh, development programs, especially in the resource limited settings for such kind of people uh, who are always ready to help and uh, knowledgeable and uh, uh, work as a team, despite not very high on the education uh, level. I, I, that's why I said, I think education is not just degree. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's not, it's not always a degree, which yes, actually matters. Yes. We actually yes. keep saying just because somebody hasn't gone to a college that that person can't be knowledgeable. They can be yes. knowledgeable without that. And I think that's where we come see. If you recognize someone who is like that, and you need to actually then nurture that, you know, yes, yes. And appreciation again comes a yes. Yeah, yes. good way. Yeah. yeah, they they will always, yeah. I mean, that that person probably saved the life of the patient that day. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you hand? so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Preeti, you had your hand up? Yeah, yeah. While we are all very uh, having a very con candid conversation over here, as well as on the group, one of the most important things I've learned from my experiences and others as well is along with what to do, I have also learned what not to do. Yeah. That again is a very important thing because most of us, see, all of us are all qualified. We all know the basics of everything. But there are times when you just forget a few things or you try to miss a few steps or, you know, you just, you just don't recollect at that particular moment. So when I read about something that has gone wrong with somebody else, it helps me plan for the next possible case that I'm doing. So there's a lot of learning, deleting, relearning, unlearning, adjusting, adapting, you know, these are things you'd learn on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's like, you know, there's no end to learning on this group. And that's what I appreciate the most over, uh, over a period of time that I've been associated with the people here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Preeti. And I think... Uh, As... Uh, hello. Hi, hi, Dr. Kale. Hi. As just now, Preeti said, I can recall one of our professors from Jeju Hospital 
now is no more professor shirolkar when mm. we were residents he used to always tell us ekhadya case madhe kay karaycha he nahi kalla tari chalel pan kay nahi karaycha he kalla pahije that is the most important what to do translate, if you don't know please translate yes <laughs> if 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 you don't know what to do in a particular case that's mm. okay but mm. you should know what not to do yeah that is very important so that is what priti was saying yeah uh hmm. now after having this wonderful sessions for last two days uh hmm. i think our responsibility has been definitely increased and we are looking forward to welcome you all here in mumbai for the wonderful workshops in on 18th and 19th please welcome thank you thank you dr kavya i think um, uh, w- uh, about uh, what not to do that comes with uh, experience that comes with age absolutely and, uh, you know you can know what to do in you can like for example difficult case you might actually put out okay, put a center line outer line this that yes yes so that anybody can do that but Uh, coming to that hey i think we don't require this in this patient i will that that comes with experience i think that's where it is and if you don't learn as you are actually going higher and still have then probably you haven't learned more uh, at all that's right uh, so before go yes so we can dr vikas and dr prasanna because you are the organizers so I last want, vote oh, be yours i was very uh, impressed with uh, dr uh, bhandari's talk and this mantra of train and retrain or you get ready to get decayed yeah that's very very nice and very correct absolutely prasanna last last but not the least here yeah, the main <laughs> person behind all this running around yes. no sir it's it's prasanna is our backbone it, yeah it's, absolutely it's always absolutely. it's always been a team work sir every person has done their bit and every pan everyone has contributed to absolutely. the success and uh, i'm really grateful to all the delegates as well for showing faith in us and registering in such huge yeah. numbers and uh, i hope we can live up to their expectations absolutely we will we will we will, we will. We will. <laughs> and yeah. uh, we are waiting uh, to wholeheartedly welcome everyone to mumbai and uh, give them a taste of the academic as well as a little bit of the social life <laughs> over here yeah. amchi mumbai yes. amchi, amchi mumbai, mumbai. Yeah. thank you dheeraj for your thumbs up and uh, see you everyone uh, so this thank this you. Thank you, our two days two days of the academic event and uh, see you all uh, soon see in you. mumbai thank you <laughs>